Fox Sports. Three, two. He convinced Dan Ugla a couple nights ago to do it. Ugla then convinced Mike Stan to do it and Gabby Sanchez to do it. Tommy, anything to this? Well, you know how players uh, can be superstitious. I think sometimes things work. But all in all, what it is is good swings in pitchers' situations where they had nice hitters counts. Just put a good swing on it. I don't know about the superstition. Yeah, nothing to do with the yeah. Sox. Okay, let's take a look at some of those good swings last night. By the Marlins. Well, the Marlins have had some terrific at bats against the Tampa Bay Rays, starting with Mike Stanton. How about Ronnie Paulino? He's done the same thing. Hanley with a big base hit last night. Chris Coughlin is 8 for 16 this year against the Rays. Dan Ugly hitting 357. There's nothing to the sock thing. Oh, well, I can't believe <laughs> Cody convinced you to do that. You know, yeah, Cody talked to me before the game and but I see what you have. Ugly got to you. <laughs> That's right. We figure, hey, if it works, roll with it. And if it works, maybe the Marlins will do to Jeff Neiman what they did the last time they saw him. And that was in Tampa. They hit one of the Rays' best, one of the American League's best. Well, we talked about Neiman in that series. He had not lost a game in that building since May of 09. He was able to get the curveball over too well. So he had to rely on his fastball. The Marlins were able to get to him. Wes Helms with a big home run. And we have the same matchup tonight as we did in that game in Tampa. And it's a couple of big guys, Jeff Neiman, and he'll go against the Marlins' Chris Volstead. Yeah, Neiman is six foot nine. Volstead, of course, is six foot eight. And Volstead, when he pitched, pitched very well at the drop. The key, as always, for Chris, good two seamers down, gets a lot of ground balls. How about getting Carl Crawford, one of the toughest, to hit into a double play, to hit into that DP in Tampa. So if Chris Volstead does what he did in Tampa, he'll go six innings, maybe more. He gave up just four hits and a run to the Rays in that game. No changes tonight. Stay the exact same way. Yeah, so Volstead and the Marlins trying to make it two in a row against the Rays. They took two of three from the Rays who at that point had the best record in baseball. Last night they come out and open the series nicely with a big hit. Mike Stanton with a grand slam. Coming up, we're not ready yet for first pitch, but we're getting there. When we get back, the Marlins give back to the community. I can't believe Tommy Hutton is even wearing socks tonight.
three-game weekend series, fifth of six this season between Tampa Bay and Florida. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Frank Ford. All week long, the Marlins have been hosting a series of morning baseball clinics, and it wrapped up this morning here at Sun Life Stadium as the Marlins hosted some 250 kids from the RBI program that is reviving baseball in the inner cities. About 250 kids were here today. And if we can roll the video, we'll show it to you. Annabelle Sanchez was doing a lot of stuff uh, with pitching in the bullpen. As you can see the kind of uh, turnout they had today. And there's Annabelle in the bullpen waxing poetic on the changeup, the cambio there. Brian Barden was teaching some of the kids about the infield drills. Taylor Tankersley took care of the motivational stuff. Emilio Bonifacio was teaching outfield play. Jorge Sosa was teaching pitching as well. One young man who's an alumni of this RBI program out of Central High School in Miami and Broward College dropped by. He is just drafted by the L.A. Angels, and he lent his support this morning. I've been in the Mars RBI program for about seven years now. It's meant a lot to me. It's afforded me a lot of opportunities that I've never had before, and it's allowed me to play baseball beyond any expectation I've ever thought I could. And it's helped me grow and mature as a man, and it's been real good for me. And I felt it was my duty or obligation to come back and talk to the guys because I was in their shoes not too long ago, about three years ago, and I got a lot of opportunities afforded to me, so I felt it was my obligation. I had to tell those guys and help them. All right, George Barber, an alumni of the program, drafted by the Angels. He's negotiating now. If he doesn't sign, he's going to go to Auburn University. But uh, the Marlins very proud that George came out of the RBI, reviving baseball in the inner cities program, to get where he is today, and that is a prospect to play Major League Baseball. Good job by the Marlins holding these clinics in the morning and a great turnout today from the RBI program. Coming up, game two of the series, Chris Volstad on the mound, a rematch with Jeff Neiman and the Rays. That's coming your way next. By Checkers, little place, big taste. By Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit us at geico.com or call 1 800 947 Auto. By Toyota, moving forward. And by Publix, where shopping is a pleasure. South Florida tonight, Super Saturday, Marlins and Rays. Ready to go. The Vuvuzelas are out. Some horns being given out. This is uh, sounds like a World Cup soccer match, so this should be fun. Good ball game last night. The Rays trot in here, though, having lost six of eight. Still, I mean, 41 to 26. John Chaso leads it off. Carl Crawford in left. Evan Longoria has found his cap 
and he is a big time RBI guy. Carlos Pena is at first, Ben Zobrist in right, BJ Upton in center. Reed Brignac gets the start at second, Jason Bartlett at short, and big tall Jeff Neiman hits ninth. Well, Rich, uh, Chris Volsad has pitched a couple of pretty good games against uh, the Rays. He's one and one in his career, most recently his last start in Tampa. Six innings, four hits, a run, and threw the ball extremely well. And he's got a much better earned run average here in this ballpark, too. John Jaso takes down low. Lance Bartsdale is our arbiter behind home plate with Ed Rapowato, Tom Hallion, and Wally Bell out on the bases. Jaso, the catcher, a very high on base percentage guy, is on base percentage at 407. And so that's why Joe Madden, who has tried BJ Upton in the leadoff spot, sticks with Jaso. Against the right handers. Well, we didn't see Jaso last night against the lefty, but he's led off seven of the last eight games. Upton's on base percentage 322. 2 1 coming. And Volstead misses down low. <laughs> 3 1 is smacked in a right field, and Stanton is over to get it. He'll pick it up. Jaso is aboard. With a base hit. Marlins defensively tonight. Well, this is a defense that we've seen for quite some time with Coughlin, Cody Ross, and Stanton in that outfield. Cantu and Hanley on the left side, Dan Ugla, Gabby Sanchez, and Ronnie Paulino getting settled in and entrenched behind the plate. Carl Crawford now with Jaso at first base. That's a strike on the outside corner. The high sock club tonight includes Cody Ross at center. Gabby Sanchez at first base. Mike Stan in right field. Like it. And Dan Ugla at second base. The Rays have shown that they will run any place, any time, especially the guy at the plate, Carl Crawford. Though Jaso certainly is not a base stealer. He has stolen one this year. The breaking ball, and that's a strike. Any place, any time, but one of those uh, times and places wasn't the right place in time last night when BJ Upton tried to steal third in the seventh inning with their club losing, and he was thrown out. Oh, two coming. That one fouled back to the screen. This Not is a, a night that uh, that Austin Powers would like. <laughs> <laughs> With all these horns out here, it's a uh, the Vuvuzela in miniature. Don't wake the baby. I can remember a time back in the 70s and, and early 80s when they used to be able to bring into ballparks horns like this, not as shrill and not as small, kind of a longer, deeper horn. They were present throughout baseball. Well, I'll say one thing it's going to require on both parts, uh, both teams, uh, an extra amount of concentration. Just missed. Not too often, Rich, do you see Carl Crawford in a, a stretch as he's in now. The last 12 games, 9 for 47, a 191 batting average. He was 1 for 5 last night. Crawford has been one of the race's best run producers, driving in 36 from the two spot. Delayed steal, or maybe Jaso just saw that the ball was down and he bolted for second. It's going to be interesting to see how this is ruled because I think it was a delayed steal. You always like to see the runner in a delayed steal take that little shuffle coming off the bag. And then as the pitch crosses the plate, that's when you're kind of uh, taught to go ahead and take off. 
And well timed, and it turned out the ball got away from Ronnie Paulino, too. And Jaso does get credited with a stolen base. Bolstead throws a gorgeous changeup and strikes out Crawford. Boy, to establish this pitch early sends a really good message to the Tampa hitters. A good changeup getting Crawford. Here is Evan Longoria. Longoria, an all star his last two seasons, a gold glover last year. Signed to a, a long term contract through 2013. And the Rays actually have three more years of options 2014, 2015, and 2016. To left field, Coglin is over. He's there and he makes the catch. We used to have one of the best audio men in all of sports television. But Mark Butler has run screaming from the truck 10 minutes ago. They're trying to run him down in the parking lot beyond the uh, stadium. Somebody said they saw someone running like a madman out of the uh, ballpark. <laughs> Mark, come on back. It's a challenge with all the noise in here tonight, that's for sure. And, pain. and Rich, it will require an extra amount of concentration from the broadcast team, too. We're up to the challenge. We'll give it our best try. Volstad misses down low to Carlos Pena. By the way, the Marlins have held uh, Longore in check pretty well this year. He's just two for 15 with that fly ball out. Pena was one for three last night. The damage early by the Rays was by the guy who's on deck, Ben Zobrist. He had a two run double against Robertson, and the Rays had a two nothing lead. Pena fights off that fastball and dumps it down in the Rays' bullpen. Pena's numbers in, in most columns are pretty darn impressed with the 15 homers, the 46 runs driven in. Yet he's hitting below 200. His on base percentage is above 300. He has walked 36 times. 46 hits and 46 RBIs. And he pops him up. Hanley out. Coglin in and Chris gets it. A swarm of bees. We are scoreless.
scoreless ball game bottom of the first. Marlins lineup looks this way. Chris Coglin, Gabby Sanchez, Hanley Ramirez, Jorge Cantu, Dan Ugla, Cody Ross, Mike Stanton, Ronnie Paulino in interleague play. Chris Polstad will hit ninth. Well, a guy that the uh, Marlins saw last week in Tampa, big guy, 6'9", Jeff Neiman. And the one thing that in talking with some of the hitters, talking with Jim Presley, Neiman struggled a little bit with his breaking ball, getting it over. So the Marlins were able to look exclusively for the, the fastball. We'll see if Neiman is able to get that breaking ball over. That makes him a little bit tougher. The one guy that he was able to dominate in the Marlins lineup that day is at the plate. Chris Coughlin. He struck Coughlin out three times. And so Coughlin shortens the button, takes the strike. Didn't like the call. Saw him shake his head. And it's 0 1. Neiman back to work. That's up. And in. That's where he got him a lot last week with that hard stuff up. It's odd because Coglin's had such great success against the Rays this year. He's now 8 for 16 against Tampa Bay. Five doubles, a triple, and he has scored eight runs. Two for five last night, and they were both doubles. Coglin has 14 doubles now. Yeah, one was down the left field line, one down the right field line. But he's one and two now against Neiman. There's the sharp breaking ball. Joe Madden echoed the same thoughts that uh, you got from Marlin hitters and from Jim Presley. He said it wasn't the Neiman that he'd been seeing all year last weekend because without that command on his breaking ball, everything else kind of falls by the wayside. 2 2. Coglin on the ground. Reed Brignac makes the play. Let's see how this Tampa Bay club sets up defensively. We talk about the excellent speed in the outfield with Crawford, Upton, and Zobrist. Longoria in Bartlett. Reed Brignac getting the start at second base. Sean Rodriguez the night off. Pena at first. And. John Jaso behind the plate. Here's Gabby now. He was one for four last night. And he takes down low from Neiman. Sanchez having a terrific rookie year. What's the scouting report on Jeff Neiman? Well, a fastball has sink. He's uh, usually very efficient uh, as far as pitch count per inning. And his out pitch is that big curveball. Had some sink on that one. It's a strike. Right now, he's averaging a little over 13 pitches per inning. And that's the fewest in the major leagues. But that wasn't the case for him at the trop last week. There's that, that big curveball. That's a little more of a slider. He'll throw a slider too. Yeah, the Marlins got him for five runs in six innings. Gabby had a single. The big blows. Jorge Cantu and Wes Helms had home runs. That one pulled foul. That's three and two. Gabby's name in the National League rookie rankings. He is leading in doubles. Second in hits, second in total bases, fifth in RBIs, third in batting average. If the season were to end today, certainly Jason Hayward would be the rookie of the year. But I suspect that Gabby Sanchez would warrant some votes and some second place votes for sure. As the Marlins can avoid the offside trap, they should be okay tonight. That one is fouled back. You know, the other guy, 
in terms of rookies of the year, Hayward offensively, and I'm just looking at offensive numbers. But Ivy Garcia of St. Louis is uh, having an all-star type season. He's got to be in that rookie of the year conversation as well. Yeah, you start uh, zeroing in on uh, offensive players, but yeah, Jaime Garcia, as far as pitching, has been tremendous. Mike Davis, again, folks, he's been solid in the middle of that Mets lineup. Mets in one eight straight with a loss this afternoon to the Yankees. Which is certainly news for Rays fans because the Rays and the Yankees have shared first place for the last six days. Off the end of the bat, Neiman won't get it. <laughs> and then flips to Pena, who is 10 feet off the bag. That's a tough play for a six foot nine pitcher, <laughs> let alone a guy who is six feet tall. See now, guys in Gabby's dugout will be all over him and say, How can a guy, a big guy your size, hit a ball that softly? A little squibber just out of the reach of Neiman. But if I get it to the first baseman, I got a shot. The only problem, Carlos Pena was right there, too. <laughs> and the base hit for Gabby Sanchez. I will say this watching that replay of Neiman on Fox Expo is a reminder that one of the big plays in the ball game for Chris Volstad in St. Pete was a similar play only Volstad was charging and had to flip to home plate and and on that last play I thought I saw a loose ball foul. <laughs> Here's Hanley now. Hanley one for three with an RBI single last night. Also walked. And a fastball misses up. Hanley doubled against Neiman. Gabby's at first. Chopper over the middle. Brignac, Bartlett, and Hanley bounces into a double play, and the Marlins are done in the first. We're underway and scoreless. And 6 1 on a Sunday. Here on a Saturday with the uh, Vuvuzelas going in the ballpark. Ben Zobris steps in. BJ Upton, Reed Brignac will follow. Volstead looking for win number five. Sort of a batting practice fastball there. 
for a strike it's one and one. As you would expect uh, in checking on the splits for Chris Volstead more ground ball outs and fly ball outs that's good that's always a good sign for him. Good change up he has a real good pace going too. He's, he's getting the ball getting the sign and wanting to work quick, quickly with it. You talk about the splits and, and getting back to the ground balls and that's kind of getting back to what he was in 2008 his rookie season. Right center Cody is on the spot. And he makes the catch. Chris Volstad in his rookie season made 14 starts was six and four and his ERA was under three it was two point eight eight his ERA jumped two point three oh from 08 to last year last year's ERA was over five and in twenty nine starts he gave up twenty nine home runs here's BJ Upton he takes a fastball up yeah this year on the Marlins starting staff The guy who's had the home run problem has been Ricky Nolasco. He's allowed 15. Coglin's under it, and he makes the catch. The next Corona Marlins watch party is on Thursday the 24th at Cadillac Ranch All American Bar and Grill inside the village at Gulfstream Park. The Marlins and the Orioles will be there at 7:05. We'll be in Baltimore at Camden Yards. You can meet Billy and the Mermaids, win tickets to upcoming games. And bottles of Corona and Corona Light are just 275. Visit Marlins.com for more information. How ironic, Rich, we're talking about ground ball outs, and Chris Bolsad has yet to record a ground ball out. A strikeout and four flyouts. We saw a lot of Reed Brignac in the series over the weekend. Jason Bartlett was still on the disabled list. Bartlett is off, but uh, Brignac is still here, and he lines it out to Coglin. There's another fly ball. On. So, so much for the ground ball fly ball splits. Blow those horns. With a special offer from Checkers, log on to the Marlins page at FoxSportsFlorida.com. Click on the big Buford button for a special offer. <laughs> That's the fun part. We've, we've looked around the crowd to see who's blowing the horns. It's kids, it's moms, it's dads, it's grandma. Oh, yeah, it's uh, grandpa. It's full circle, everybody. Cantu pops it up. Right in the middle of everybody, BJ Upton. Over the clamor says that he has it. Marty Kansas is struggling right now, Tommy. Yeah, you know, he got off to such a great start. He's been so solid. Even though he did have earlier in the year an 0 for 19. 
But with that fly ball out, Jorge Cantu is now over his last 16. Well, Jeff Neiman will do that to you. Opponents are hitting just 219 against him this year. Gabby Sanchez with an infield single. Here's Ugla. Dan two for three last night in his last two ball games. Four for his last six. With three runs and three walks. And he takes fastball for a strike. Hey, Jeff Neiman is fifth in the American League in earned run average. And you have an ERA of 2.83 in the American League. That says something. He was an incredible performer for Rice University his sophomore season. His sophomore season, he was 17 and 0, and Rice won the national championship, won the College World Series, and they had a devastating rotation: Neiman, Wade Townsend, and Philip Humber. Fastball misses up. Neiman was the fourth pick overall in the 2004 draft by the Rays. Philip Humber was the third overall pick in 2005 by the Mets. And Townsend went eighth overall in the first round in 05 to the Rays as well. But it's a good illustration of how even can't miss prospects can miss. The only guy still in the big leagues is Neiman. And so goes this uh, game of baseball. Not an easy game to take it to that final level, the major league level. There's the good breaking ball that we heard he did not have last weekend. We saw it. You know, we saw it last weekend, but we didn't see it in the strike zone too often. He was having a little trouble getting ahead. But once he gets ahead, he drops that big curveball in. And this time, gets Dan Ugly. Here's Cody now. 0 for 3 last night. Drove in a run. Neiman has that great plane, that six foot nine frame, that downward plane that pitching coaches preach and scouts get so excited about. The Marlins staff themselves are, are great examples of that. The guys like Volstad and Josh Johnson. Yikes, what a breaking ball. Jeff Neiman just trotted out a sharp breaker on the outside part to Cody Ross. Still scoreless.
Chaso for the Rays. And Bartlett digs in and takes down low. Bartlett, a rough night last night. He was 0 for 4, but then again, he was facing Nate Robertson, his personal tormentor. Bartlett is now 0 for 27 against Robertson in his career. And as we uh, promised you last night, we asked Nate about that, if he was aware of it. And he said yes, because last year, as a Tiger, he faced the Rays, and that number came up, and someone told him about it last year. He remembered having success against Bartlett. And somebody else, too, he said. Yeah, he said, uh, check the numbers on Jason Kubel. And Bartlett now 0 for 27. Kubel 0 for 15 against Robertson. Nate was not aware that that's the longest 0 for against a starting pitcher by a position player in all of baseball. Here's the interesting uh, thing about those two hitters, though. Bartlett, a right-handed hitter. Kubel, a left-handed hitter. But either way, Nate Robertson was very good last night. He picked up the win, kept things steady, had a season-high six strikeouts. Have you ever seen Chris Volstead go through eight hitters and record seven outs and none of them be on the ground? I would guess not. One of the things he's he's been able to do his changeup has had a few hitters off balance and he's got some little weak fly balls with that pitch. Neiman with a big swing and a miss. Struck him out. Volstead with a nice curveball. Now Chris Volstead saying, you know, Jeff Neiman, I, I've seen your nice curveball to free some hitters. I know you don't hit a whole lot, but there it is. And now you can go back to the dugout. That's a great pitch. Fox Tracks brought to you by Toyota. Jason. Well, the Marlins, and we mentioned this last weekend, just trying to get back at what the Rays have done to them over the last couple of years. Good pick by Gabby. And there is your first ground ball out of the night. Mike Stanton coming up when we get back. and all but uh you know i'm just glad it's for four runs that you know help us get uh this win of course the four runs coming on the swing deep in the at bat as well stan got a fastball and just got it over the fence for a grand slam and he will lead it off here in a scoreless ball game in the third now against jeff neiman he had a couple of base hits 
on Sunday in St. Pete. Yeah, and each of those base hits drove in runs. He he has hit this Tampa club very well. All eight of his RBIs against the Rays. Mike Stanton six for 14 against Tampa. Fastball up from Neiman. Stanton now eight runs driven in. Fouls that one off his foot. He counts one ball, one strike. Coming into play tonight in interleague play, the American League had the advantage 74 wins to the National League's 66 wins. Strike, and I got to be honest for you, it has not been a good day for the National League. Angels hammered the Cubs 12 0. Tommy pointed out the Yankees beat the Mets. Oh, great breaking ball. Stanton knew it and was moving to the dugout before the ball even hit Jason's glove. Jeff Demon has struck out the last three that he's faced. Pitch and set up this one was the fastball in that was. Strike, even though it was just off the plate, and then he dropped that good curveball. So the curveball working for him tonight. Here's Paulino. Ronnie is hit in five straight. He was three for four last night. Toronto beat the Giants on an Aaron Hill three run homer in the eighth. Three nothing was the score. Boston beat the Dodgers five to four with a run in the bottom of the ninth. And Jake Peavy enjoyed pitching in a National League park again. He threw a three hit shutout at Washington. The White Sox won one nothing and Peavy had a base hit as well. A lot of pitching going on in that series. Of course that matchup last night. Steven Strasburg. Ten strikeouts in the seven innings. Gavin Floyd went eight innings gave up four hits in a run for the White Sox. No decision. Paulino to center. A lot of room out there. B.J. Upton is capable of covering just about a, every foot of it. And, and covering it with ease, yeah. too. And that game last night, Steven Strasburg has now struck out 32 in his first three starts, and that's a major league record for any pitcher to strike out that many in his first three starts. As we noted last night, the Marlins have four series against the Nationals left on their schedule, including the first series after the All-Star break right here at home. And you would think that with the All-Star break, Strasburg is going to get one of those starts. You, you got to figure Jim Riggleman's going to align his rotation for the second half of the season. And, and you bet Strasburg is going to be one of the three. Let's see if Neiman gives Chris Volz that little payback and drops a curveball in on him. <laughs> yep. yep. <laughs> see, he said, you did it to me. I'm going to give you mine. Four strikeouts for Neiman. Both big right-handers look sharp tonight.
Coach Gatorade reunites two high school rivals looking to finally settle the score. Don't miss the documentary premiere on Sunday at 9 o'clock. Check your local listings. Interesting numbers tonight when you talk about pitchers. <laughs> Look at that. Douglas got the earplugs. He's going for it. Last night, Garza threw 71 pitches. Look at Eddie Rapp's got him going, too. Garza, 71 pitches in an inning in the third. Both pitchers combined through three innings tonight have thrown 72. I think it was. Uh, Bobby Bonilla, who went with the earplugs at Shea Stadium. I know they banned Greenies from the game, but I don't think uh, Excedrin is uh, on that ban list. There's probably a lot of that being passed around tonight as well. Stan will pick it up. And this is a dangerous combination for the Marlins, and that's Carl Crawford at first base and Chris Volstad on the mound. Chris at six foot eight is one of the slower to unfold to the plate. And of course Crawford one of the best base dealers in his generation. Yeah Carl Crawford 23 steals this year 385 Number in his career. Runner goes pitch out Paulino's throw safe. He stole on a pitch out. That's how good he is. A better throw probably would have had him. Yeah, I think if the throw's down a little bit, Ronnie's uh, going to be upset with himself because he had a clear view, pitch out, right call, throw a little high. And by the time the tag is applied, Crawford with his tremendous speed just gets to the bag. It's very close, though. Very close. Looks like that tag might have got him, but. Crawford picks up the steal. And so Evan Longoria now is sitting on a 2 0 count with Pena and Zobrist waiting behind him. Three and zero. Oh. Them. Longoria now is at first. Now it gets a little tough. Good speed on the bases. You got the middle of the order. JM Lexus presents our leaders of the game. JM Lexus price made us number one, 18 years in running. Click jmlexus.com. Find out how. JP atop the list. Pena fly to shallow left his first time up. And don't go to sleep on Crawford and Longoria. Because they'll steal third and second on you. If you do. Carlos Pena is 32. Born in the Dominican Republic, moved to the Boston area. That's where he grew up. Went to college at Northeastern. Early in his career, he was a top prospect. The Rangers, and then Oakland, and then even Detroit. And then when his numbers fell off dramatically, found himself a free agent with the Yankees, a free agent with Boston, then a free agent with the Rays. Once he got to Tampa, he just took off. Everything clicked. Yeah, he was a first round draft pick of Texas back in 98. Pulls it foul. Volstead stays out in front 0 2. He is in the last year of his contract. Carl Crawford is in the last year of his contract. 
And so the Rays, I don't want to say a, a, a lot of urgency, but there is a sense of urgency that uh, this year needs to be the year. World Series in 2008. Time called as Volstead came to the plate. Whether the Rays can re-sign both or one or neither remains to be seen. One thing is for sure, though, they have been able to get a lot of mileage out of Pena, and Crawford has been the best player in Rays history. Pitches fouled at the plate. Remember the other night we were talking about Michael Young setting the record, the franchise record for hits. We were going from team to team wondering who the franchise leader was for other teams. Crawford is the leader for the Rays. Yeah, Carl Crawford's name is uh, on top most of the lists. The one thing Chris Volstead would love here is a strikeout, and Pena has struck out 75 times. Pretty much an all or nothing guy, but you can't get him with that strikeout. A liner into right field, base hit, Stanton up with it, Crawford to third, Stanton bobbles, and Crawford is still at third. Ball was hit so hard, and Stanton did show the arm off a bit last weekend, so the Rays know that, and with nobody out, playing it safe was Tom Foley. Well, I got that pitch up, and that's not where Chris wanted to. At this point, at the bobble, Crawford had stopped at third. Tom Foley is third base coach with the red light on and, and and rightfully so because he had the ball well before Crawford got to third and there's nobody out. Single walk single so far for the Rays. Marlins are, are looking for a win on a day where the other teams above them lose, and that hasn't happened very much in the last week to ten days. But as Tommy pointed out, the Mets have lost, and the Phillies are in, in just in a madhouse scramble in extra innings, trailing 13 to 10 to the Minnesota Twins in Philadelphia. Minnesota Twins getting a taste of Citizens Bank Park. Yeah, there have only been nine home runs hit in that game. All of a sudden, the Philly offense has caught fire. Ryan Howard had four hits, two home runs last night. He has one tonight. Zobris pulls that one foul. I'll tell you the interesting name on that home run list is Jim Tomey. Jim Tomey coming back to Philadelphia as a twin. The Twins scored five runs in the top of the ninth to send it into extra innings. Both teams scored a run in the tenth, and the Twins just scored three in the eleventh. One-one coming to Zobris. Flips it out to left field. Coglin circles it, makes the catch. Here comes Crawford, and the Rays are on the board first. Well, if you can minimize the damage in an inning like this and allow just the one run when Tampa had bases loaded and nobody out, you've done a pretty good job. So now Chris has more work uh, to do. He gets one out on the sack fly. DJ Upton, he popped out to shallow left. The Rays are such an interesting team in terms of statistics on base percentage, offensive efficiency, defense. 
a reflection of how Joe Madden manages and puts the game in motion. The Rays have grounded into just 39 double plays, and that is the least amount in the American League. Well, there are a couple of reasons. Yes, he puts plays on. And people would say, why don't other managers do that to stay out of double plays? You have to have speed. You yes. have to have guys who run. And he has guys who run. The Twins lead the American League. They've bounced into 79 double plays. 3-0 coming. And Carl Crawford is grounded into one, and that was last weekend against the Marlins. There's a grounder, Hanley, Ugla, the turn, they got them. <laughs> All you have to do is talk about it, Rich. Chris Volstead does give up a run, but the Marlins get that elusive double play ball. Weekend on a Super Saturday, OAR is here at Sun Life Stadium. And this anthem, this town has become uh, quite the hit in Major League Baseball, especially on all the uh, Fox Sports regionals, including this one, the Rays and the Marlins. It's Tampa Bay 1, the Marlins nothing. Bottom of the fourth, Chris Coglin stands in against Jeff Neiman. And the big six foot nine right hander delivers a fastball that misses down low. And we welcome in Mark Roberts, who is in the vocalist, lead vocals for OAR. Mark, how are you? I'm doing very well. Good evening. How are you guys doing? Where are you guys tonight? You playing somewhere tonight? No, tonight I am off. I'm in uh, in New York having um, having a great dinner with my dad, my oh, brother. Hold on there. Uh, Deep drive right field. Gone. Chris Coglin with a home run. Hey, good timing, Mark. As soon as you came on, Chris Coglin went deep to tie the game. Uh, that sounds so good. The crowd getting louder and louder. Chris Coglin leads off the fourth with his fourth home run. And the Vuvuzelas, the horns that are here tonight, are in full throat. <laughs> wow. Coglin jumping on this fastball. As we watch it, Mark, I'm sure as an entertainer, there's nothing like electricity in, in an arena or where you're performing, is there? You know, I'll tell you what, sitting on the other end of this phone call, I could feel it growing. You know, you see that I could see the ball going, and it's just from the crowd noise. And you guys are from the uh, Columbus area, so you're, you've got to be big sports fans. That's Buckeye territory. 
Yeah, that's right. You know, we all came from the East Coast, but ended up out at the Ohio State University. And, uh, yeah, you instantly become a Buckeye when you enter that school. So it was a great, great four years. Tell us about this, this song, This Town, because uh, throughout baseball, we've heard it in a lot of stadiums. We've heard it on a lot of telecasts, uh, Big Fox nationally, and certainly uh, in a lot of the Fox regionals. How did that come to pass? You know, we recorded this song with one thing in mind. We, we thought about the crowds that we've run into throughout cities of America. And uh, the College World Series um, last year needed a song, and, and we combined with that as well with this town. So it's always kind of lived within sports. And um, I think I can relate to the athletes and teams of just like you just had, the crowd roaring, and you just want to take that vibe from town to town. That's what the song is and what it's for. Hanley Ramirez stands in now with one out. And a 1-1 ball game. That one misses inside. Mark, you had a little taste of uh, baseball when you guys performed at the Home Run Derby in Pittsburgh, right, in 06? Yeah, you know, we've, we've been blessed to be able to be a part of the All-Star game in Pittsburgh. We've uh, just been around athletic sports, professional sports, for a couple of years now. And, uh, man, you got Ramirez down. That is a hell of a player, I'll tell you. I hope you guys can hold on to him. High chopper, Longoria's throw, got him by a step. All right, Mark, for the fans that are coming out next weekend for a Super Saturday, what will they see and what will they hear on your show next Saturday? You know, I think what we're going to try to bring to the stadium is, is just a lot of energy. I mean, we know that it's a, a, you know, a sports facility, but for just a little bit, it's going to be a rock and roll facility. And we, we really try hard just to kind of feed off the vibe of the crowd. So... You know, for us to be able to play in the baseball stadium is something kind of new. We've only done it a few times, but I, I know the crowd's energy is going to be familiar. So we just, we're just we looking forward to having a good time. I hope you guys are, too, and that's really all we intend to do. That'll be fun. Super Saturday, next Saturday, Marlins and Padres and OAR. This is Jorge Cantu, a Chris Coughlin home run, has tied this game at 1-1. And Cantu takes a strike. Any, any gigs between tonight and Saturday? Where are you guys going to be before you get here? No, you know what? That is going to kick off our 2010 touring. So, yeah, that will be the first night of our, uh, our big summer that goes June, July, August, September, and October. So this is a big first night for us. You know, it's going to be a big night. So you guys are going to be fresh and ready to go. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> We've been bottled up for a few months now. So we're, we're getting ready to go, you know. Hey, that's like us getting ready for spring training, you know. <laughs> that's exactly right. All you want to do is get on that field, you know. <laughs> One, two to Cantu, and he fouls it off back to the screen. I, I would be remiss in, in just dropping in that our director, Jim Holly, is a Michigan man. But I think we can all get along. Mark Butler, our yes, audio man. our audio man is a, a Buckeye as well, so you're in good company. You know, it's funny. Everywhere you go, you run into either, you know, the Michigan folks or the Buckeyes, and no matter where you are, what age you're at, or wherever that rivalry lives, it's amazing. I don't know where. I've been all over the world, and these, these Michigan folks are giving me the stink eye every time I wear a Buckeye shirt. You guys don't have a Vuvuzela player in your band, do you? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, no, we don't. That is, uh, I, I just feel like I'm getting attacked by a swarm of mosquitoes or something. You know? Yeah, we've uh, obviously heard him on the World Cup, and we got him going here tonight. Yeah, I was, it's the first time I've heard him in an American sports game, though. I'll tell you that the World Cup stuff, I thought something was wrong with my TV. Two and two to Cantu, Neiman, with a 2 2 pitch. And it's in the dirt. Counts full at three and two. And there's Dan Ugla waits on deck. Marlins and Rays here, game two of a three-game series. Marlins winners last night. Three-two coming. Cantu fights it off foul. College campuses. Certainly that's where you guys got your biggest distribution when you started things, right? Yeah, you know, we, we basically went away to, to college with the um, with the goal of being in a band on one of the biggest campuses. And then, 
over the course of those years, we just kept traveling and going to school at the same time, and I think we just kind of, I don't know, we might have caught a good wave there and, and been able to play at colleges, and now we, we return all the time because there's a really good vibe around uh, you know, college. It just feels really, uh, I don't know, it feels like you're always in it when you, when you step on campus. All right, Mark, well, thanks, and I'll tell you what, as the... Uh... The Rays got a run in the fourth. The Marlins got a run in the fourth. And so here's the fifth, our subway fifth inning. Play Hardy fresh. Yeah, the Rays had scratch for that run. A couple of hits, a walk, sack fly. Marlins got their run on one swing. Fastball from Volstad misses inside to Reed Brignac. Chris got a double play ball off the bat of BJ Upton to end the fourth. Ray's got the run on the sack fly by Zobrist. And a pop up floats out of play. Well, some good news for the Marlins is the shooting match is over in Philadelphia. <laughs> 13 to 10. Minnesota beats the Phillies. So the Mets go down. The Phillies go down. And if you're scoreboard watching along with us, the attention turns to Atlanta, where the Braves are taking on the hapless Royals. 3 0 Atlanta, and that's in the bottom of the fourth. Brian McCann's hit his seventh. One guy the Braves would like to see get going a little bit, Brian McCann. Not quite having a normal season quite yet, but you know he's going to be there when it's all over. High drive, right field, deep, Stanton. Makes the catch. So we check in with Frank Ford. <laughs> Well, it's loud down here. Hey, guys, you know what? I love when Tommy has one of those prescient moments. Last night he talked about what a hitter's league the Pacific Coast League is. And wouldn't you know it, the Marlins AAA affiliate last night, the New Orleans Zephyrs, a 20-3 win over Memphis. But get this, they had a 13-run fourth inning. Sent 16 batters to the plate, 10 hits, 3 walks. All of those runners scored. The inning featured three-run homers by Brad Davis, Donnie Murphy and Scott Cousins and the pitcher Brian Lawrence made two of the three outs in the inning. So the Zephyrs put up a club record 13 run inning last night. And Tommy, you're right. PCL, that's a hitter's league. You should know you played in it. Oh, yeah. You, you like to play in that PCL. A lot of good hitter sparks. 
AutoZone Park in Memphis is where that game was played. That wasn't even a game in Albuquerque or Colorado Springs. Now those are two great hitters parks. Now years ago, like late 60s, it, there were good parks and bad parks. You, you'd have to make your tour of the Northwest and uh, try to hit in Tacoma and Vancouver. Inside corner. Nice pitch. Jason Bartlett tied up. We've seen that pitch called a couple of times, even though it's been borderline. But you, you love to see Chris show hitters inside, go in that area, and he caught that corner. That's just a, a perfect pitch to get Bartlett, whose struggles continue. Bartlett 0 for 6 in the series. Here's Neiman. Takes a strike. We joke about Neiman being big enough to be a basketball star, and of course his sister was for the national championship Baylor Bears back in 2005. How about that? I mean, you got two members of the family play for national champions at the Division One level in different sports. Neiman was a starter on Rice's national championship team, and his sister Emily. Scored 19 in the title game back in 2005. So she ended up at Baylor. She did. And then she transferred to UC Santa Barbara. Both of Neiman's parents are Texas grads. But his uncle and grandma went to Rice. There you go. They got it covered. Yep. Big swing and a miss. Volstead strikes him out. Works a one, two, three, fifth. This ballpark is buzzing. You by Marooney, South Florida. When you need a car, truck, or van, who are you going to call? 1 877 Marooney by Tobacco Free Florida. Escape the addiction of tobacco. Be free. Visit FloridaQuitline.com by South Florida Ford. Visit SouthFloridaFord.com for great offers. And by Florida Power and Light, learn smart ways to conserve energy. Log on to FPNL.com and take a free home survey. Hey, look, Tommy, a monkey. Our subway fifth inning. Play hard, eat fresh. Jeff Neiman and Chris Bolstad have been outstanding in this one. You see just five hits combined through four and a half innings. Yeah, these guys are both locked in. They're both in a nice groove. Chris got a little bit out of his groove when the uh, Rays were able to score their run in the fourth inning, but really minimized the damage, allowing just the one run. The Marlins got their run quickly on that to blast off the bat of Chris Coughlin who's hit in 16 of his last 18 games now. Now to the high sock portion of the Marlin lineup and Neiman dusted them off striking out Ugla Ross and Stanton. 
And he starts ugly out with a good breaking ball for a strike. And then a dive bomber of a change. It's 0 2. Yeah, I think you can see the difference in Neiman this start because he has his secondary pitches working. Down goes Ugla. Dropped down a little bit and gave Dan a different look too with that delivery. Here comes Cody. Cody was called out on strikes in the second. Uh, maybe the best pitch that Neiman has thrown all night. A sharp breaking ball right on the outside corner. Cody had the helmet off, was peeling off the batting glove as it was going into the glove of John Jaso. And Neiman's out in front, 0 and 1. Change up in the hole, boxed by Bartlett. We'll see if it's a hit or an error. We got to that ball so fast. If he picks and throws, he might get the out, and I think he's going to be charged with an error. Wouldn't have been an easy play by any means, but if he picks it cleanly, he has a shot. Marlins will take the base runner, especially with Stanton coming up. Our AT&T trivia question. We flip the phone. Who holds the rookie record for Grand Slams? Rookie record for Grand Slams. So that's anybody, any rookie, any time. Either league. Boy, you have to think of some great rookies. How about a Fred Lynn? A great rookie season. Stan takes outside. And then you think of the three other players before their 21st birthday who hit Grand Slams. We saw Mike Stanton do that last night. And the other three, Jose Reyes, Andrew Jones. And A Rod, Alex Rodriguez. Well, if you want to go back and, and just start with the career leaders for Grand Slams, it's Luke Gehrig, right? 23? Yeah, I believe Manny's right on his tail. Manny Ramirez. Alex Rodriguez. And A Rod, is, yeah. They're, they're both on his tail. Eddie Murray, Willie McCovey, Robin Ventura. Had a uh, great career in terms of grand slams. Jimmy Fox, Ted Williams, Hank Aaron, Dave Kingman hit 16. El Caballo has hit 15. Babe Ruth hit 16. Stanton swings and misses, and it's one and one. The great Gil Hodges hit 14. Outside. Stan had some terrific at bats against Neiman last Sunday. Patient, got deep in counts, line balls into center field. Yeah, he stayed back on pitch as well. Both of his base hits were up the middle. Ross hit first. 2 1 coming to Stanton. Last time when 
Neiman had two strikes on Mike Stanton. He throws it with that good curveball. Caught him looking. Did he go? No. Ed Rapuano with his earplugs in. That's one we talked about the other night. It's a 50 50. So does Neiman go back to that pitch or does Stan get something straight? Last weekend he wouldn't have. This weekend he might because he has a much better feel for it. But as a hitter with two strikes, you've got to protect it. You've got to be ready for that fastball. I'll tell you one thing that Cody Ross has done a little more of this year, and that's run successfully. He has stolen five bases this season. He's running. Swing and a miss. Jay So's throw. Safe. Brignac tried to sell the call. It was dashing towards the dugout. But Tom Hallion, a veteran umpire out there, wasn't biting. Cody got a pretty good jump and he got the curveball to run on. So Neiman did go back to that curveball, not afraid to use it 3 2. And Cody able to get there and steal his sixth bag of the year. Or did he? He had that left leg up and it didn't look like it hit the bag. When you slide like that and your left your lead foot doesn't get the bag right away you expose yourself and I think the Marlins caught a break. Yeah that could have been called the other way. So Neiman is going to pitch to Paulino. Well Neiman's been around the plate all night. This is going to be his first walk. And certainly the the choice, the correct choice to pitch to Chris Bolstad who's on deck. Bolstad does have an RBI this season. Just three for 20. In his 20 at bats, he has struck out five times. Dad will step in. <laughs> Chris, it shows you the type of athlete that he is. And we just try to keep the inning alive. And he runs pretty well. He's not a slow man. He uh, dropped down that butt. He was getting down the line pretty well. And certainly uh, Longoria at third base not expecting and Chris Volstead to drop down a bunt. No. So he had him back. He took a peek. He saw that. Figured if he got on base he'd get Cogman to the plate. Counts 0 and 1. See, most dads upset at himself for swinging that pitch. And what he has to remind himself is about half the Marlin hitters tonight have swung and missed at that pitch. Dan Hugler has, Mike Stanton has. 0 2. Nasty stuff from Jeff Neiman. We've played 5 1 1.
USA Network, and he's not big leaguing us tonight. He was actually here four years ago when the show first started. It wasn't a hit yet, throwing out the first pitch, and you're back tonight. Yeah, it was great then. It was great tonight. I've, I've thrown out the first pitch uh, once every year, and, and, and it doesn't get any easier. <laughs> Now, how big a baseball fan are you? Did you have a favorite team growing up? Yeah, I grew up in Massachusetts, so of course I'm a Red Sox fan. So I actually am going to throw out the first pitch in Boston on July 3rd. That's going to be the highlight of probably my life. No disrespect to the Marlins fan. <laughs> my son would be very excited. He's a big fan of the show. He's a big fan of Bruce Campbell and you. What do you attribute the, the success of the show to? Well, I think we appeal to such a wide range of people, 15-year-olds and 50-year-olds. Uh, we have a lot of action, some sexiness, but most of all, it's smart. I think people appreciate that. And you've actually become friends with Jorge Cantu and Evan Longoria, both the third baseman tonight. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to root for them because every other inning, i got to root for the other guy. But because I'm here, I'm here uh, as an invitation from uh, Matt Britton, who runs this kind of event for me. Uh, I have to root for the Marlins. Well, it's great to see you wearing your Marlins jersey and representing, Jeffrey. Good luck on the rest of the way on the show. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. You. Guys, back to you. That's just like our shows, Tommy. Action. But maybe without the sexy stuff. Yeah, we, we showed we showed a little sock tonight. We had our pants up tonight. <laughs> John Jaso in the left field. And the Rays in business. Top of the order is aboard. Here comes Crawford. Then you got Longoria and Pena. And this is the group that gave Volstad a, a problem back in the fourth inning when the Rays got their run. Crawford singled, Longoria walked, Pena singled, and a Ben Zobra sacrifice fly gave the Rays their only run of the night. So Jaso's at first. That ball's hit to center field, hit pretty well. Cody turns, runs, track, can't get it. It's off the wall, picks it up. Jaso is headed to third. He's going to score. Crawford is right behind him. He's in with a triple. All right, Carl Crawford, sixth triple. He leads the American League in that department. He can absolutely fly. And that ball found that, that triangle area. And, and Cody, as he went back on it, kind of got right where the, the padding meets just before it juts out into that little further distance. But this ball was struck well by Crawford. Right up there is where Cody has to change directions because the ball got into that little corner. Jaso scored easily, and, and I'll tell you, it's one of the quickest uh, runners you'll ever see get to third on a triple. Now Longoria, who has flied out and walked. The Rays have the lead and a chance to add to it. The infield is in.
Good spot for Volstead. And it's one to one. Active triple leaders. And it pulls him in front of Johnny Damon. Yeah, look at those guys. All those guys can fly. Longoria bangs it in the left field, and the Rays have a couple runs just like that. Now, all of a sudden, three well struck balls. The base hit by Jaso hit well to left field. The triple certainly hit well, and that time, Longoria got himself a breaking ball, stayed back on it, and drilled it for an RBI single. Last year, 113 RBIs for Evan Longoria. Mentioned is the Marlins had, have held him a little bit in check. That breaks an 0 for 11 overall, but he's just 2 for 16. 3 for 16 now against the Fish this year. Randy St. Clair, the Marlins pitching coach, is out there. If you like pitching, yeah, you like good baseball. Tomorrow, you either want to be here or you want to be watching. Tim Wood is up in the bullpen. Josh Johnson and David Price tomorrow. Two of the best. You have the American League's leader in wins, and David Price, 10 and 2 with a 2.31 ERA. And then you have JJ bringing his 186 ERA into the game tomorrow afternoon. There's the matchup. Vanderbilt's finest, David Price, and the pride of Jenks, Oklahoma, Josh Johnson. JJ's ERA right now is third in the National League. Ubaldo Jimenez, 1.15. Gregoria diving back. Jaime Garcia is 1.59. You got Matt Kane, Tim Hudson, Roy Halliday, Mike Pelfrey, Adam Wainwright, Giovanni Gallardo. All in that uh, top 10. One and to Pena, single to the fourth. Goria has 10 stolen bases this year, not running. Ball in the dirt, now he is running. Actually, a slow trot will do. And a wild pitch, he moves up, and this has become a messy inning now, in which all three hitters have reached base, two of them have scored. I think you see against this ball club, like the changeup got away from Chris and from Ronnie. Against the Rays, you just can't make the little mistakes. You have to play airtight. Defense, you have to play that kind of game, do all the little things because they usually do all those little things correctly. Change up misses up and in. Now he's gone three and oh. Chris sailed through the fifth after giving up the run in the fourth, but the Rays have two here in the sixth. Time call. Hey, you rips that one into the seats. We were talking earlier about the likelihood that the Marlins would face Steven Strasburg in that first series after the All Star break. But the Nationals here for three. In the series before the All Star break, there is a high likelihood that the Marlins will face Dontrell Willis in Arizona. Four game series against the Diamondbacks. Dontrell still having his struggles, so he had a no decision last night in Detroit. And back pitching against uh, his club that he was with for a few years. And, and in his five innings, he gave up five hits, five runs, walked four, and had four strikeouts. Got a no decision. 
Arizona lost that game 7 5. Breaking ball with the runner going. Boy, and again, uh, all the Rays seem to be smart base runners, good jump by Longoria. So even if Chris is slow to the plate, and we know that, he has to be exceptional in changing his delivery, looking more than once back at the runner, just kind of changing things up. If you do that, more likely Longoria is not going to get that kind of jump. Three and two. To Ugla out in right field. And he makes the throw that will move up Evan Longoria to third base. And we'll flip the phone. You get a lobby, a, a vote here. Dropping Eddie Murray on us, who's the uh, rookie. I said that through Freddie Lynn. I'll go Eddie Murray then. Alexi oh, Ramirez. Ramirez. We just saw him in that series in Chicago. That's right. He did have four grand slams. How about that as a rookie? Four grand slams. 2008. Mm. Infield's back in for Zobrist. Yeah, you get this point of a ball game uh, with the score the way it is and with the way Neiman's pitching, you have to try to cut down this run if at all possible. Zobris was in a situation like this in the fourth inning and hit a sack fly to left field. Marlins haven't had uh, runners in scoring position much at all, you can tell. And the Rays with a 3 1 lead. Zobris has driven in one. And he got tied up, fouls that pitch back. It's one and two. Bolstad is not a strikeout pitcher. He's not a guy like a, a Nolasco or a JJ that has that devastating pitch that he can go to in this spot. Fifty three strikeouts for Bolstad on the season. That's what uh, was impressive in reading about that Steven Strasburg start last night. Guy who throws 98, 100 miles an hour, six of his 10 strikeouts were on his changeup. Ground ball back to Volstead. Nice job by Chris. Good changeup, too. Just enough to have Zobra school a little bit out in front. And with that nice six foot eight wingspan, Volstead, you know, that wasn't a great pitch, but he had him fooled. And he was able to bounce off, make that play. And, and you're right, a very good athlete. Chris played high school basketball, and he moves well out there. Upton. Longoria still at third. Upton to left. It's high, it's deep. Coglin looks up, <laughs> off the top of the wall, and Upton kind of jogging into second base. And I'm really surprised. That he wasn't going harder. With his speed, Tommy, he probably should have been at third base. He could have been at second base as the ball hit the wall. He just conceded the two base hit. And that two base hit is going to chase Chris out of the game. For many, you thought it might not get to the wall because it was hit so high. No chance at all for Chris Coughlin. 
high atop the wall. When you see that as a center fielder, you get over there to back up, and there's Cody Ross. Let's watch BJ up. He thinks it's gone. He's in the home run trot. He's still trotting. The Marlins are going to make the move. Chris Polstad is out 4 1, Rays on top. Tim Wood to Reed Brignac, and just like that, he bangs it into the corner, and it lands foul by maybe a foot. And the Marlins are fortunate. Brignac thought he had himself an RBI extra base hit. And to bring Upton back to second, Brignac back to the plate. Tim Wood has come in into what was a tight pitcher's duel, but the Rays, with three runs here in the sixth, have a 4-1 lead. Yeah, situation right now for Tim that he needs to get this out, and then the offense has to try to produce something against a guy who's been real tough, and that's Jeff Neiman. There is Upton. Tough thing about Neiman as well is this pitch count is pretty manageable right now. He's thrown 70 pitches in five innings. Two and one to Brignac. Saint Amant, Louisiana. Cousins, the Sheets brothers, Andy and Ben Sheets. I bet he has a little Cajun ball in it. Wood strikes him out. But the Rays strike for three. And lead it now 4 1.
Told you that Neiman's pitch count was at 70. He has punched out seven. He's walked just one. And that walk was intentional. Coglitz Homer, one of only two hits. Gabby Sanchez had a little cue shot infield single as well. That would have hit the Durham Bowl. Kevin Costner couldn't have made that play. Where is that on Fox Trans? There's no way. I don't think that. Oh! Very, see, I'm waiting for the dot to, to end up above Fox Tracks one of these nights. Well, I can use the telestrator to get it up there. <laughs> Neiman misses inside. 2 0. against Tampa Bay. Hitting 279 on the season and he takes low and inside. How about the progression of Chris Godwin? Hit 188 in April, hit 252 in May, and hitting over 430 in the month of June. Takes a strike and it's three and one. Highest on base percentage of any major league player in the month of June. Crowds went up the middle. Rimyak was such a good fielding shortstop coming up in the Rays system. Very good second baseman as well. The Marlin All You Can Eat seats, you get a club level ticket, all the hot dogs, peanuts, nachos, popcorn, and soda you want. Next All You Can Eat night is Friday the 25th, the Marlins and the Padres. 305626 save or visit Marlins.com. Here's Gabby. I've seen Gabby try that a few times. He talked about it. The Rays need a win to remain in a tie with the Yankees. Atop the AL East, Boston only a game behind. Breaking ball misses up. Ball and a strike in and out in a 4-1 game. There are the standings. The Rays feel kind of odd at this point, not being in first place because they've been there for so long. 58 days starting on April 22nd. And the last six days, they've shared the top spot with the Yankees. Now they win this ball game, and that streak continues. It'll be seven days in a row. Chopper to third. The Gold Glover Longoria. Our Fox Expo look. Not only a gold glove, but a fine arm. And just a solid all-around player, Evan Longoria. Two time All Star. Probably be there again this year. Hanley oh. takes a strike. Boy, a team that took a blow, and speaking of All Stars, and, and a guy that's going to be out for about six weeks, Troy Tulowitzki, the uh, Rockies shortstop. Hit by a pitch, an avulsion fracture, and a broken wrist. I see, I just say broken wrist. <laughs> you looked into that medical glossary, and what'd you come up with? It's a, it's when the bone gets torn. Uh, I, don't, I don't even want to go there. <laughs> Here's the 1-1. Uh, one, one. In the dirt. Either way, not good news for Rockies fans. At the very least, they say six weeks.
Bradley cranks one left field deep and gone. And the Marlins get one of them back on a mammoth home run by the Marlins shortstop, Hanley Ramirez. Now, there are times when you can throw a style point or two into a home run. When you hit one like that, you know that it's going to be out by a long way. But the Marlins hit two solo shots off Neiman. This one, well out of here. Hanley knew it. Took a little peek, flipped the bat away, circled the bases. The Marlins hit two long balls against Neiman. In that start on Sunday, the man at the plate, Cantu, and Wes Helms, and Hanley and Coughlin have both gone deep in this one. The problem is the Marlins can't get anybody on base in front of those guys, or at least haven't so far. Cantu is 0 for 2 in this one, and 0 for his last 17. When you see Jorge Cantu in the last few days, he's done it. A little bit out in front of everything. Everything he's looking foul. When he stays back, stays behind the ball, you hear that term often, and can drive a couple of balls. He's not a guy that hits a lot of balls to right field. But just to drive a couple of balls up the middle, you know he's going to start falling into place and getting some hits. But most everything now that he's hitting hard, he's hooking foul. Up and in, it's three and one. And even showing some frustration. So bad. Marking out some instructions. You see if the Rays bullpen. And yeah, Jim Hickey is on the phone. Bobby Ramos gets the call. All-time Marlin hit list. Andy Ramirez now is tied for fourth. With Miguel Cabrera. And someone is getting up there, taking their time. 3 2. Cantu stayed on that one and lines it to Longoria. Marlins settle for a Hanley homer and are down by two.
for the New Marlins ballpark. Become a Marlins season ticket holder in 2010 and reserve your spot in line. Seat selection in the New Marlins ballpark is underway for current season ticket holders on 877 Marlins. Here's the number to call. Jason Bartlett trying to bunt to get on. Tim Wood still out there in the top of the seventh. Marlon Bullpen trying to hold the Rays at four and give their offense a chance to come back. Bartlett, the pitcher spot, and John Jaso. And you have to think that uh, that might be all for Neiman because St. Blaylock is in that on deck circle. Still just at uh, 89 pitches, though, for Neiman. That tells you that Joe Madden has confidence in his bullpen. Neiman in the dugout. Grant Balfour down in the pen. Wood misses outside to Bartlett. Two and two to the Rays shortstop. Battling through injuries this year. His numbers down dramatically from last season. Yeah, since his uh, return from the disabled list with that hamstring injury, he's 0 for 9. And you, you put together an 0 for that he had going before, he, he's 0 for his last 21. That one misses inside. And Bartlett is aboard. Here comes Blaylock. Hey, Tommy, the uh, fantasy auction is coming up next Friday. And we've been telling you about uh, tickets for just $50. Also, the beach zone out there is up for bid and on sale. You can get 30 game tickets for that Friday night game on the 25th against the Padres. All you have to do is go to Marlins.com. Blaylock takes a strike. Go to Marlins.com and up on the top menu, go to auction. And when you hit auction, Billy's picture pops up and click on that. And you can enter a bid to have that beat zone all to yourself. And right now, the bid is at $750. And that's a steal. 30 tickets and an all you can eat buffet. So, all you can eat, 30 game tickets, beat zone, a Friday night against the Padres. Billy the Marlin will visit. Maybe he'll jump in one of the uh, cool tubs. And that can be yours. The bidding closes next week. So the auction is open. All you have to do is go to Marlins.com, go to the auction menu item on the top of the uh, web page, and go to Marlin Auctions and put your bid in now. If you're planning on coming and joining us for the uh, auction, that's a great way to do it. Not to mention they'll be down there in our territory. Or we're going to be up here. We will be up we'll here. We'll be up here. Okay. I remember last year we had some difficulties with a storm. Yeah. It did bring us up here. That's <laughs> why we were up here. We're going to be up here this year. But the uh, the party will be on the concourse. And anybody that is in the beat zone is also welcome up into the auction area on the concourse as well. So if you buy the beat zone for your group of 30 for that night, you are included in the auction party, which includes the festive all-you-can-eat buffet, the music, and the auction items. Little tapper to third. Cantu gets one. Ugla. Got him! Great turn because Ugla got tripped up as he came across the bag. Wow, that is outstanding. And you talk about hanging in there, getting the throw. Blaylock reaching on our checkers double play of the game, but watch Dan Ugla. He gets upended by the runner, Bartlett. Watch Bartlett. Clean slide, picks Dan Ugla. Little, little help from Gabby Sanchez, but just an all around tremendous 5 4 3 double play. When you're getting the throw as a second baseman, remember he had to. Play a little bit over to pull with Blaylock, so he had a long way to go. You're getting the throw as a second baseman from the third baseman 
you can barely see that runner coming out of the corner of your eye. But you can hear him. Dan Ugla heard Jason Bartlett, but he hung in there, took the throw, took the slide, and made the throw. Jay So, the leadoff hitter, takes down low. He is an on base machine. He's been on base twice tonight, both by singles. He hasn't walked yet tonight, but he's 3 0 here. Tommy, he has walked 25 times now and struck out just 15. Well, that's why he came into this game with an on base percentage over 400, and that's why Joe Madden hit, has him in that leadoff spot. They say that hitters are born, that there's an innate ability to hit, and obviously you can work on it and refine it and all that. What about a guy with a strike zone and the discipline of a JSO? Are you born that way, or, or can you really figure out a way in the minor leagues or the big leagues to get it done that way? Not so sure if you're born that way, but you really have to have a lot of patience and then confidence that you can hit with two strikes. And I think a lot of guys, that's where they, they lose it. They just don't feel confident to hit with two strikes. So. Consequently, they like to swing early in the count. But I, I do think it's something you can learn. And some organizations teach it more than others. Oakland, uh, one of the ones that teaches it a lot. Brandon St. Clair out to talk to Wood, who walked Jason on four pitches and is falling behind Crawford. And the Marlins quickly have Jake Mente up. Here in the seventh. The other thing that's tough in the minor leagues, Rich, coming up, you always feel, at least years ago, a little different in some organizations now, but you always felt that, you know, in order for me to get up there, if I'm a hitter, I, I have to show I can hit. Like, you know, get that batting average up, drive in some runs. Well, it's gone 3 0. Oh. To Crawford. Longoria is next. Crawford, I don't think he thought it was a ball. I think he just didn't hear the call by Lance Barksdale, which was a little late. Missed on the 3 1 pitch. Wood has walked three here in the seventh. First light, freeze camp. Let's freeze. It's tough to do. Freezing Carl Crawford. Crawford stealing. Oh, that's close. There's the tag. There were a couple of bang bang plays when Cody Ross stole second, and when Crawford swiped second. Crossbrook, Coors Light, freeze camp. So aside from the double play ball that Wood got, he's walked the other three hitters that he's faced. And now a great RBI man, Evan Longoria, is up, driven in 52 this year. Well, you really hate to see this late in a game like this, uh, all the walks to, to give the Rays base runners. You're just opening, uh, opening that door to have yourself a bad inning. So right now, Tim Wood has to make some good pitches to a good hitter. the best of ball strike ratios you want to see that the other way around and Longoria helps him out uh, he thought that he might see a fastball again and he didn't he saw a slider
Got the fastball, lines it to left. Coglin back, and he reaches up and makes the catch. Marlins dodged the bullet there. Still 4-2. We'll give you a little uh, update on how things happen. A sack fly early in the game put the Rays on the scoreboard. They had a one nothing lead. I'll tell you what though, that was erased quickly on Chris Coughlin's fourth home run of the year. A no doubter. It was a one one tie. In the sixth inning though, little struggles for Chris Bolstad. Big triple by Carl Crawford bounding around in that Bermuda Triangle out there produced the run. Crawford at third base came in to score on that base hit by Evan Longoria. And then it was B.J. Upton thinking he had a home run. Hit it deep enough. It hit off the wall. A two base hit. That gave the Rays their fourth run. The Marlins were able to pick up their second run on that Hanley Ramirez shot. His 11. So the Marlins have two solo home runs tonight for their only two runs. And now we head to the bottom of the seventh inning with a pitching change. Looks like Grant Balfour, the pitcher for the Rays. A loud night here on a Super Saturday. Marenga in concert to follow. 4 2 the score. And there is Balfour. He has had a terrific year. Balfour has been in professional baseball for a while, We're all the way back to 1997 with the Twins, got to the big leagues with the Twins, Brewers, Rays for the last four seasons. Pretty much a fastball slider guy, but one of those guys you hear us talk about throws real heavy sinking type fastball. Tommy has the uh, baseball scouting report on him. There's a strike to Uglo. But a guy who has been around, as you just mentioned, and it's funny how sometimes you know, a guy will get into a, a bullpen with a certain ball club and all of a sudden everything clicks. Uglo's gone three and one. Uglo Ross and Stanton here are the seven. Even was tough in his six innings. Three hits, two runs, two solo homers. Now the count fold three and two. Uglas walk yesterday in that ball game in game one. Back in the first inning was a, a key at bat. Ross followed with a bases loaded walk, and then Stanton unloaded with the grand slam.
now that Stanton has hit a home run and hit a grand slam, you almost find yourself when you start an inning, you look down to see who's up, and you see Stanton hitting third, and you think to yourself, just get a guy or two on. Standing in that tunnel, getting a good look at Grant Balfour, who he'll be facing soon. Ugla has fought off two fastballs and, and two fastballs that have been borderline the pitches you have to swing at. But Balfour is making some good pitches with the count three and two. 23,242. Ugla says that's one too many signs. We saw Balfour shake off uh, Jaso three times. And he missed with the breaking ball, and Ugla walks. Tommy gave you the uh, scan report on Balfour. Frank has more on this. Uh, Unique athlete. All right, guys, we all know baseball is an international game. Balfour from Australia really came about the game by accident. He was a soccer player, his dad a rugby player, and I wanted to make him feel a little at home today, so I brought out my Australian rules football prior to the game. We had a little kick and a couple of hand passes back and forth. He said he didn't play footy too much, but really enjoys watching the game. As I said, he and his father, when he was a kid, they were driving by a park, or as he called it, an Aussie slang, a reserve. They saw a T-ball game, said, Dad, can I play? And that's how we got involved in baseball. But uh, he knows a little something about Aussie football. Guys, there was actually an Aussie rules football game in this very stadium, I want to say about 20 years ago. A couple of Aussie football teams did a North American tour, and they played here with reduced sides, 18 to a side, down to 11. And that's how I came across the football. I've had it ever since. I decided to try it out today and see what Grant can do with it, guys. Yeah, Frank, I could just hear his dad telling his friends, yeah, my son, the sissy baseball player. <laughs> I think he was happy to, to not have to wear those tight shorts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, does it first Cody calls timeout. He steps out. There's an opportunity now and you know we we mentioned this often you have a guy out there who's throwing so well as Neiman. Sometimes it doesn't matter who comes in even if he has good stuff. It's just a different look and a good A.B. by Dan Ugly to get things started and draw the walk. Cody got a good fastball to hit. It's one and one. And yeah, the Marlins three and one against the Rays this year. But over the last two years in 2008, 2009, two and ten against the Rays. Ball and two strikes. So the Marlins pen, there's the Rays pen. Joaquin Benoit. Look at that ERA. Barely visible, 0.54. Line drive. Caught by Pena, steps on the bag. Ugla is doubled up. Not a whole lot you can do if you're Dan Ugla. If you take one step towards second base, you're going to be nailed at the bag. Boy, that would have been a lot of trouble, too, if that ball got by Pena. Home Depot doing more on defense. You can see Ugla was looking out towards right field to try to see what kind of break Zobris got on the ball, and it never got there. And so Stanton comes up with nobody on base. And he's behind in the count, 0 and 2. The Royals have mustered up four runs to tie Atlanta in Atlanta, 4 4 in the eighth inning.
stays away from the breaking ball. Let's see, there's Peter Moylan, there's Ryan Roland Smith, Grant Balfour. Have we who are the other Aussies? Well, the, the first in the modern era, there might have been one or two back in the early 1900s, but the first in the modern era, Craig Shipley, a good friend of mine. Shipley, uh, I saw him as a shortstop in the Padres organization. Yeah, now works uh, as an assistant to uh, Theo Epstein and the Boston Red Sox as their uh, international scout. Stan, watch that one outside. Boy, that's a, a good eye. I think he... He was a little unsure, a little late call by Lance Barksdale. It was a borderline pitch. Here it comes. And it's, it, it, well, those, it could have been called, but he takes the walk. And once again, the Marlins are able to get the uh, tying run to the plate. Got some American League Aussies. So Luke Hughes of the Twins, Justin Huber of the Royals. Brad Thomas, a pitcher. I think he's with the Tigers. Grant Belfour having an inning uh, such as Tim Wood last inning. He was helped out by the double play, but he's walked a couple. And again, another one of those meetings on the mound having to be broken up by the home plate umpire. Chick-fil-A Family of Champion Series premieres with a Father's Day special. This program highlights a relationship between fathers and sons throughout the football careers of Colt McCoy and Greg McElroy Jr., how they influenced them to be great players as well as great men. The Chick-fil-A Family of Champions, Saturday at 10 on Fox Sports Florida. Sunday at 10. You can Tebow it. Tebow it. It's Saturday at 10. DBR or Tebow, either way. You can get that started 24 hours ahead of time. Saturday at 10 is almost here. <laughs> It'll be Marlins Live. We may stop at Chick-fil-A on the way home. We could have a big finish at 10 o'clock. Polito has flied out and was intentionally walked. Mike Lamb is on deck. Balfour misses outside, and it's 2-0. and Ronnie's a good fastball hitter. Likely to get one here. Kind of a, uh, a dangerous throw by uh, Jaso. Stanton really wasn't that far off the bag at first. So it's 3 0. Oh. Fastballs in a row to Dan Ugly tried to keep him away. Lost him. So, Balfour has walked three. Joe Madden says enough of that. And he's got his uh, lineup card with him. He's on his way out to the mound. Here's Armour Rooney called to the pen. When you need a car, truck or van, leave him a car.
Jiu-Jitsu you can keep your edge with Just for Men mustache and beard. The Rays started, went six innings, three hits, two solo homers. That's it. And Joaquin Benoit walks into this ball game. Well, he walks in with some uh, terrific numbers. 24 strikeouts, four walks, and an opponent's batting average, 094. This guy has a nasty fastball with some sink. He cuts it. Good slurve and a changeup. Mike Lamb stands in. First pitch is outside. Joaquin Benoit was invited to spring training after undergoing rotator cuff surgery in January of 2009. A longtime member of the Texas Rangers bullpen. Guy that had a, a a lot of success in the middle of the pen for the Rangers. Did not pitch last year because of his rehab. Uh, the Dominican Republic. He is 32. Fouls it back. He's gone after him with a couple of good fastballs. Mike Lamb's had good swings, but right back with foul balls. Stanton and Paulino, there actually have been three walks in the inning. Remember, it was a line drive double play off the bat of Cody Ross that erased Ugla. One two coming to Lamb. Got him with a nasty changeup. And the raised pen comes through in a big spot. Quick work by Joaquin Benoit came in and got Mike Lamb and bails out the Rays. And here is Jay Bente. He comes on for the Marlins because Lamb hit in the pitcher spot. And Bente we called upon to get Carlos Pena, Ben Zobrist, and BJ Upton. Kind of an interesting uh, seventh inning. Tim Wood walked three, hit double play, and, and was able to get out of things. And the Rays pitchers, Balfour. He walked three, got a double play though, that line drive double play in between, and was bailed out by Joaquin Benoit. Carlos Pena now with Ben Zobrist and BJ Upton. 
Pena is one for three. Bente getting his first taste of the big leagues this year. Pena a couple hits in the series. Bente. The 26 year old out of Evansville, Indiana. Went on to play at Purdue. I think the one thing we've seen in the appearances of Jay Bente is that he has, and, and if he can keep that pitch down, he has a very good changeup. And it's a pitch he likes to use a lot. Bente is an under the radar guy because. He's climbed through the organization as a middle reliever. And when you look, in there's his curveball. When you look at an organization, you're looking at starting pitching down in the minor leagues. You might look for a closer every now and then. You might try to develop a closer. And Bente has not closed much at all in his career. But every year he would uh, turn in an ERA in the low threes, the mid twos, mid threes. Well, he loses Pena though. Now he's got Zobrist and Upton waiting. Let's track it on Fox Tracks. Number eight, Had to be close, but just off the plate. Well, you're walking on uh, real thin ice when your bullpen comes in and starts walking guys. And the Marlins were able to escape things in that seventh inning, but you can't keep trying, it, especially against a good club like the Rays. Let's see how the Rays play this. Zobrist is 0 for 2. He tries to bunt and fouls it off. Not a bad guy to hit and run with. Couple stolen bases for Pena this year. St. Louis tonight. Matt Holiday is homered against his old team. High fly ball down the right field line. Stan giving chase, and it's out of play. It's deep, but it's out of play. And I'm not talking about the Rockies. He's homered against Oakland. 4-2 St. Louis over Oakland in the top of the ninth inning in St. Louis. Jason Mott is in there trying to uh, save the game, but Oakland has runners at first and second and nobody out. Here Jay Bente is trying to get Ben Zobrist. Ground ball. Ugly got one. Hanley's turn. No chance. Zobrist runs well. Well, fielder's choice, one out. Here comes BJ Upton. Good pitch after the uh, fastball that Zobris pulled foul. Then they came back with a changeup, had him roll over on. Him. Number two, center fielder BJ Upton. Here's Upton now. He hit a high fly ball that banged off the wall for a double. And were it not for a home run trot, it probably would have been a triple. Yanks that one in the hole and into left field. So two hits tonight for BJ Upton. 
And Bente will face Reed Brignac. Nothing is ever easy in the seventh and eighth innings. Not this year. Brignac has flied out twice and struck out. And it's interesting too, Rich, if, if you're ahead four to two, you want that seventh and eighth inning to go by smoothly to set it up for Nunez. If you're behind four to two as things are tonight, you want to keep it that way and give your club a shot. And you can't do it by walking guys, letting pitches get away. Been a tough night for Ronnie Polito behind the plate. I think they're going to call it a wild pitch. It very easily could be a pass ball. Yeah, that could have been a pass ball. I think it should have it, been it, a it, pass yeah, ball. Yeah, it did not hit the dirt. It caught Ronnie's glove. So the Marlins are going to walk Brignac and bring up Bartlett. That is 0 for 2 with the walk, and certainly it uh, it leaves Bente without a net here. If he walks Bartlett, he walks in a run. Well, he had Bartlett. 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 Yeah. And the pitcher spot looks like uh, Willie Ibar switch hitter in the on deck circle. So a boilermaker goes against a sooner and Ronnie Paulino out to chat quickly with Bente. See, I think maybe they should allow electronics in the game, Tommy, because then the, the catcher wouldn't have to go out there. He could just text. To the pitcher. Yeah, and then the uh, pitcher wouldn't have to cover his mouth with the uh, glove. The catcher wouldn't have because nobody would be able to see that. Just read the text. I like that. Pro strikes. Like that. It's all in one. As we've seen the Rays many times already in this series, the entire infield will converge. Even without the catcher going out. Joe Madden can just put the infield on his friends and family list and just blast a, a text out. Everyone would get it. Zobrist. Upton. Reed Brignac. I have the feeling Joe Madden's techno enough that he could do that. Yeah, too. yeah he is. <laughs> Good pitch. Bury it in the dirt. Down goes Bartlett. And the Rays are going to bring up a pinch hitter now. Defente has one of the two outs he needs. She's giving it her all, Tommy. Well, the eye bar is up. Just two for 13 as a uh, pinch hitter this year. It's a slicing line drive foul. Well, the Ibar, 27 out of the Dominican Republic, been with the Dodgers and the Braves. He had a big postseason 
Back in 2008, hit two home runs in the American League Championship Series. Hit 353 in the postseason. In 34 at bats as the Rays marched to the World Series and then lost to the Phillies. You've probably heard that name, a younger brother, Eric Ivar, with the uh, Los Angeles Angels, Anaheim. Misses with the off speed pitch. It's two and one. Bases filled with Rays in the top of the eighth in a two run game. That one almost hit him. And now it's three and one. Well, the intentional walk worked nicely to the next hitter, and that was the strikeout of Bartlett. But Bente has gone three and one on Ivor. And he lost him. And the Rays have another run, and it's 5 2. You put it right on the line when you said. As a bullpen, when you come in and start walking two or three guys in inning, you're asking for it. Marlins pen walked three in the seventh. And they've walked three here in the eighth. That's uh, six walks in the last two innings. You, you just can't have that happen. Strike and it's 0-2. Jaso has banged out two singles and has walked. His on-base percentage over 4-10 now. is in and it's two and two. Scott Strickland in the bullpen. And that one misses out. They count now three and two. The seventh. The eighth. This has been the spot that has been such an issue for the Marlins all year long. Runner goes. Jason went around and Bente strikes him out. The Rays scratch out a run. The Marlins are now down three.
caught the left fielder for the Tampa Bay Rays. Carl Crawford. A single in the fourth. Off he goes. 24th stolen base of the season. And then a 420 foot drive for a triple. The right now active triples leader in baseball. Jaguar performer of the game, 5 2. Tampa Bay on top. So, well, a couple of uh, moves, a double switch made by Joe Madden as he brings in Randy Choke. Deonor Navarro comes into the game to catch. He'll hit in the number nine spot. Choke will hit in that spot at the top of the order where Jaso was batting. Jaso made the last out. There are the numbers on the uh, left hander out of the bullpen. He is the only left hander out of that Tampa bullpen. Kind of a funky sidearm delivery. Coughlin, Sanchez, Hanley. Chris goes after that sidewinder and fouls it off. Side of the thigh. Ouch. Yeah, there's a much more tender area where it could have hit, and I don't think it did hit there, but it came darn close. It came real close. <laughs> yeah, you figured Choke was only in there to face a lefty. Here comes a Maroon. He calls the pen. When you need a car. It's a very good Tampa Bay bullpen and the Marlins down three in the eighth. Coglin is still standing at first base and that's good to see Gabby Sanchez against Dan Wheeler who spins oh. up a breaking ball for a strike. Yeah Wheeler's always been solid. Uh, we mentioned it the other night at times he has closed games. Opponents hitting 195 against the uh, Fastball slider pitcher for the most part. It's amazing that opponents are hitting 195 and yet his ERA is in the threes. They'll show you a splitter. 
every once in a while. Gabby yanks it over the head of Longoria and down the line it goes. Coughlin is digging for third. Gabby on his way to second. The Marlins have second and third with nobody out here in the eighth. And the Marlins back in business. Gabby with his 15th double of the year. That's it. That's it. He takes that slider, stays on it, and then yanks it over the head of Longoria. And good to see Chris Coughlin running the way he was. So here's Hamley, who homered his last time up. He's got a pair of runners in scoring position. is inside. It's one and all. in scoring position, not at all like this year. Wheeler broke out a fastball after going breaking ball his first two pitches, and it's two and one. A slumping Jorge Cantu is on deck. that fastball the show me pitch he'll probably go back to his slider that's a good pitch for him Slider. He stays on top of it, doesn't try to pull it. Hanley with three RBIs in this one, the home run back in the sixth inning, and this big double here. That was a good read by Gabby. Freddie Gonzalez. And Sean Cunningham are on their way out to second base. Well, if you remember when Hanley went into second base, he's kind of grabbing the back of his leg. The throw was coming in. You're always better off just to slide, to, to avoid trying to dance around the bag, strain a leg, strain a muscle. And, and Hanley didn't slide. He got, he got in there with no problem. But he had to kind of dance around the throw coming in. And you need to make sure he's okay because right now Hanley represents the tying run. You don't want him gimping out there and hurt if he can't score on a base hit. So he appears to be okay. There's no problem when he hits the ball. Jorge Cantu is old for his last 18. But his last offer was a line drive smash into the glove of Evan Longoria at third. Yeah. 
Wheeler throws that fastball by him. Yeah, here's Hanley. He, he's okay right here. But I think it's when he tries to dance around right about there just to make a quick movement to get to the back. But he, he appears okay. I think this at bat will help Jorge Cantu because he's thinking the other way with Hanley at second base. And you saw Wheeler jammed him inside. Ground ball in the hole, and it gets through to left field. Hanley limping noticeably to third. Well, Hanley took a couple of steps off and then wanted to make sure the ball got through. But once it did, he started to gimp a little bit into third base. Uh, they're going to give Bartlett an error on that. He's had a couple of tough errors, Bartlett, tonight, both going to his right. Another slider, this one out over the plate. Hit pretty well, but Bartlett lets it get under his glove. And watch Hanley. He, he pauses, sees it get under his glove. Now you see the, the gimp and the limp as he gets over to third. So there's still nobody out. Joe Madden's on his way out to the mound. He's going to go to his bullpen again. The Marlins back in this one. Down a run. And two on with nobody out. Uh, Marooney called to the pen. Three thousand on hand, and a good ball game right now. Five four. Hanley Ramirez with what looks like a sore hamstring is at third base. He moved up on a ground ball off the bat of Jorge Cantu, and Rafael Soriano comes on for what looks like an attempt at a six-out save. He has not had a heavy workload lately. In fact, he's had just one save opportunity in the last 14 games. And you can see he's been perfect 16 out of 16 with lots of fastballs and sliders. The Rays infield is in. Soriano with 27 saves last year. We saw him often with the Atlanta Braves. Right handers last year hit 138 against Soriano. Slider for a strike. Good, good numbers for Dan Ugla against this tough right hander. Swung through a slider, it's 0 and 2. The Marlins trying to do something they haven't done all year. When trailing after seven innings, the Marlins are 0 and 27. 
Ugly has struck out twice and walked. There's the slider again. That one hung middle of the plate. That was a pretty good one to hit. He's seen three of them. Oh, and two. When he's healthy, Rafael Soriano is one of the nastiest. Watch where this one is. Middle of the plate. Big, big out by Soriano. Here comes Cody now. Watch where this number four pitch is. This was even better to hit the number three, and it just locked up and up. Now the Rays infield could back up for two. Remember, Hanley is gimpy at third base. So any little tapper down the line could be an adventure. Cantu's at first. Ross lined into a double play his last time up. Breaking ball, ground ball. Dropped by Longoria. This game is tied. Tampa Bay Rays are having an unlike Rays inning. The slider, Cody Ross rolls over on it. Not an easy play for Longoria, but he had it. And as he tried to make the transfer to start the double play, he lost it, could never regain it. Hanley came in to score, and everybody's safe. The Rays have made two errors in this inning. He made a great play to get the ball. Yeah, it's an RBI for Cody, but an error charged to Longoria. Well, Mike Stanton climbs in. Emilio Bonifacio is running at second base for Cantu. Ross is at first. Slider is high from Soriano. There's Bonifacio. Obviously, great speed. Ross is the trail runner. Stan is 0 for 2. Two strikeouts and a walk. Ooh. Outside corner. If Soriano keeps painting out there, he'll be tough. That time, the fastball. Here's the 1-1. One, one. All right, he tried to paint there on Fox tracks. We'll give you all three pitches he's thrown. See, the second one was out. That was the one called the strike. And the third one was out even further. Good patience by Mike Stanton to take that third one. See if he comes back with the slider. Fastball, runners go. Bonifacio's in there. <laughs> and that's a page right out of the Rays book. Well, good heads up. Base running two by Cody Ross to pick up Bonifacio. He's safe. Longoria can't get the tag on him. And Cody followed and went into second base. But that was close. Here's a better look. And it looks like the hand is in before the tag. But it's two and two on Stanton and the infield's in. Got him. Devastating breaking ball.
This is outside. This is one of those games in which, with Cormier warming up, that Joe Madden may have said, this is where I need to save. You don't see too many managers do this. And he could still leave him in, but now with the score tied, I'm not sure. So, if Soriano keeps the lead and finishes the eighth, that might bring him out for the ninth, or maybe not. You, you, you don't know. At this point now that the game's tied, it doesn't look like he's going to stay with his closer the rest of the night. Ronnie got one of those sliders in the middle of the plate. He just missed it. It's one and two. Marlins have rallied to tie it. Paulino to left field. Did he get enough? No, he didn't. Crawford makes the count. Oh, and Soriano got away with a mistake. Marlins tie it. It's 5-5. Five, five. And he's made a couple of moves here, actually three moves. Wes Helms in the ball game at third base. Brian Barden in the ball game at shortstop. And Leo Nunez is on the mound, and they're still sorting out who's hitting in what spot. Well, the choice that Freddie has: do you hit Barden in the ninth spot, have him lead off, and have? Wes Helms in Hanley spot, or do you flip it around, have it the other way around? Carl Crawford, Evan Longoria, and Carlos Pena coming up. Ground ball in the right field, a base hit. Nunez is greeted. By Crawford, who now has three hits tonight, and his engines are revving right now. Well, with, with both corner infielders guarding the line, Gabby Sanchez trying to protect from that extra base hit. Crawford just found that big space between first and second. Longoria, RBI single in the sixth. The Marlins bullpen has not had a good night.
even though on paper the bullpen's given up just one run, six walks in two innings. Nunez takes over for Vente, who took over for Wood. Both Wood and Vente, an inning in relief. Nunez chases Crawford back. Right hamstring, a tight right hamstring is the note on Hanley Ramirez. Day game tomorrow, off day on Monday, and then Tuesday night in Baltimore is the schedule. Crawford, a good lead. a strike the throw beats Crawford he is saying now nah, my foot that throw beat him and nine out of ten times if the tag is close and the throw beats him by that much you're going to be called out here's another look at it in Fox Exmo let's see if the tag gets him for the foot is on the bag and it's tough to tell from that angle Here's a 3 1. It's foul back. I think it's just one of those calls that the throw beats him by uh, a lot. You don't expect a throw to beat Carl Crawford by that much. This might be a little better look here. Watch the right foot. Very close. I mean, we've looked at it, what, three, four times in slow motion? And, and by looking at it the three or four times, then you can say, well, it could go either way. So Nunez ends up walking Longoria. Boy, another walk from the bullpen. That is seven. One of those intentional, but still way too many. Chris Volstead started this game, and in his five and two-thirds innings, walked one. Here's Pena. Marlins bring the shift over. They keep Barton on the third base side, and Helms is now playing almost a, a second baseman spot. That's line to right. Stan coming on, makes a shoot top grab. Boy, that is not an easy catch. Top spin, ball was hit sharply by Carlos Pena. And Mike Stanton had to come in and catch that around the shins. Tough play for any outfielder, let alone a 20 year old rookie in a tie game in the ninth inning. Nicely done. Look at it. See his thumb come out of the glove? That ball nearly knocked his glove off his hand. Yeah, that's how hard that ball was hit. You think about the outs that Nunez has in this inning. Crawford singled and then was thrown out on a bang bang play at second. Longoria walked and then Pena hit a bullet to right. And the Marlins are just setting it up for some dramatics in the bottom of the ninth inning. So any out is a good out. Big change up there. This opens.
Temple's outside. It's one and one. And it's been Nunez's bread and butter to left handed hitters. James Shields is up. Wow. Probably his throw day. It's a great pitch, but if you throw it too much. Upton is on deck. He has two hits. There's the change up for a strike. When he starts it on the left hander's hip and it comes back across the plate, that's where it's at its best. Starts at the hip, moves back over the inside corner. Runner goes. Ground ball in center field. That's a base hit. Ross up with the ball. And the Rays with runners at the corners. Here comes Upton. This is a lineup filled with tough outs. Zobris being one of them. See, that's the changeup where you don't start it at the hip. And it stayed up a little bit too. If it's down, he might roll over, hit it to the second baseman. But because it was up a little bit, he was able to get a little better contact. That's a change up at 88 miles an hour. It fluctuates anywhere between 87 and 89. Think about it, the last three innings, seventh, eighth, and ninth innings now, the Rays have had eight base runners, eight men on base. They're stuffing in. Tommy is new just throwing as many change-ups right now because he can't command his fastball. He has better command of his changeup, and he has said that. That was a change -up. And if you remember, he got hurt with lack of command of that fastball to Matt Trainer. This is probably not a strike, but he gets up to the chase. It. Oh, way off the radar, but that fastball that trainer tripled on was right down the middle of the plate. One, two coming. Change up, ground ball, Barden. The short way in time to get the out. A tight rope act from Leo Nunez works a scoreless ninth by five.
brought to you by Marooney. South Florida, when you need a car, truck, or van, who are you going to call? 1877 Marooney. By AT&T, find out what's possible with the nation's fastest 3G network. AT&T, rethink possible. By Corona, kick back, relax with an ice cold Corona in live. Enjoy a Corona today. By Dodge Ram Trucks, award-winning Ram Trucks, plus a new heavy duty, make it one of the most powerful lineups in Ram history. And by Publix, where shopping is a pleasure. Now, Rich, we know the decision by Freddy Gonzalez when he made a couple of moves, bringing in Leo Nunez, but also Barton and Wes Helms. Leo Nunez hitting in that uh, number four spot. But he wanted to lead off with Barton and have Wes Helms for a Hanley spot, the number three spot in the lineup. So it's Barton, Coughlin, Sanchez, and Soriano is still out there. We told you he's had a light workload. And Joe Madden has his closer out there for the second inning. Barton does not have a lot of the bats this year. Has appeared in 31 games. Goes after a fastball and fouls it off. In a lot of those games as a defensive replacement, some as a pinch runner. And just 21 at bats. Five hits in 21 at bats. Soriano has mixed in his fastball with that great slider. That looked like a cut fastball that just missed. He was an outfielder in the Seattle Mariner organization who couldn't hit. But boy, could he throw. And he's turned into an outstanding reliever. First with Seattle, then with Atlanta, and now with the Rays. Coughlin and then Gabby. Barton went after a pitch, a borderline pitch, and fouls it back as three and two. Trust me, when you haven't had a lot of at-bats, that's a tough one to lay off of. When you're in there day in and day out, a little better knowledge of the strike zone, you can be a little more patient. He's sitting on fastball 3-1. He got the fastball just off the plate. James Shields still in the bullpen. Lost him. And... Barton is aboard. And you have some good speed on the bases, too. Well, let's see what Joe Madden does here. There may be a question as to... One of the first announcements that I heard had Wes Helm sitting there. That was the announcement in the press box, but that isn't always right. Because I almost wrote that down because it was something you and I were talking about between innings. Where was Helms going to hit? Where was Barton going to hit? You know, I, I thought I heard Barton was in the nine spot, to be honest with you. Yeah, I heard Wes Helms. So you notice Joe Madden obviously waited till the bat was over. Then went out to discuss that with the home plate umpire. Lance Barksdale, who has the lineup card and should have all the changes. Well, I mean, Freddie is, and Freddie's been tossed out of the ball game. Well, I'm guessing because he might have made a mistake. If, well, in see, the dugout, it has Barton. And so you would expect that the Marlins told Lance Barksdale that Barton was in the ninth spot and Barksdale. Yes wrote it down incorrectly. So no mistake by Freddie because you have conclusive evidence right there on the wall in the dugout where the lineup is posted and where the changes are all made. There it is. Ninth spot Brian Barton. And there's no Remember Wes Helms was on deck. See Helms Helms's name was there, was scratched out because he was on deck. He was on deck. Now you see Helms up higher in the number three spot in Hanley's spot. When Paulino made the last out of the eighth inning, Helms was on deck. 
but that doesn't necessarily mean he goes into that spot. It doesn't mean he has to go in there. No, exactly right. So Freddie has himself a good argument. Thrown out of the game or not, he's going to stay there and plead his case. Now, Freddie's getting his money's worth right now. And, I mean, there's not much you can do if the umpire writes it down incorrectly because the umpire turns around and then tells the Rays dugout what he thinks is the batting order. And that's the one that Joe Madden has in his dugout. Right. And Freddie's just hanging around because... He's listening to Barksdale try to explain this to the crew chief, Tom Hallion. Freddie knows what he did. He knows that he had Helms. He had Helms on deck. He initially had him in that spot. But once the final out was made, Helms didn't come in the game. He made the switch, put Barton in that spot, put Helms in the number three spot. And if, in fact, uh, he loses the argument, Barton is out. And uh, that appears to be the call. Tom Hallion now well that's a shame to lose leadoff man in that situation and a good at bat by Barton to draw the walk and the Marlins dugout obviously incensed right now and so Barton is out he's hit out of order but he may be coming up again soon because if he's not in the nine spot and it's Helms in the nine spot, that means Barden is in Hanley's spot and he could end up hitting twice in this inning. As odd as that sounds. Well, Chris Coughlin could solve the whole problem by going deep again. Soriano to the plate, Coughlin fouls it back. There's the Rays lineup card. And they've got Helms in that spot, but as we said, Joe Mann is going to write down what he gets from Lance Parks there. The line of communication goes from the Marlins dugout to the home plate umpire. So home plate umpire Barksdale to the Rays dugout. Basically wrote down the wrong thing. Now, how is instant replay going to solve that? In Bartsdale's mind, obviously, he he doesn't think he wrote down the wrong thing. No. The Marlins obviously jumped on it pretty quickly. And you saw the Marlins lineup card with Helms originally there, but Helms never came to the plate in that inning. And down goes Coughlin. Boy, it feels like the air has just been let out Boy, of this there was place. So much uh, after the walk, the leadoff walk, all of a sudden. And now Joe Madden is coming in, and he may be saying, all right, now what does their lineup look like now? Helms is on deck. Now Helms, it, Barton has just replaced Helms on deck. See, I was right. Yeah, now Barton has to hit in that spot that they have on their lineup, Barton. Gabby's up with two outs. Drives the ball to right center. Zogrist is back. What a bizarre bottom of the ninth. A leadoff walk is not a leadoff walk. And we go to the 10th in the middle of the storm, Lance Barksdale.
beef jerky. Feed your wild side. You want wild? The Sharpies are working overtime now because the Marlins have to reconstruct their lineup sheet. Yeah, no time for whiteout. Because Carlos Tosca went out between innings and he had to figure out exactly what Lance Barksdale had on his lineup card. It I was, think there might have been a, a note of sarcasm in, in Carlos's uh, demeanor as he went out there. All right, Mr. Barksdale, what do you have on your card? I think so, but he, the sarcasm could only go so far because you, you can't get thrown out as the bench coach once the manager's been tossed. Yeah, and it's uh, as you and I discussed between innings, it's, uh, it's an argument you're not going to win. Uh, Freddie knew what he did, but Barksdale knew what he did when he wrote down Helms and Barton in those slots. So now Brian Sanchez comes on here to work the 10th inning. And who the heck knows where Sanchez is hitting in the order now? Yeah, I'm afraid to put anything down on my card. Everything's been scrambled up. Reed Brignac. And Sanchez misses outside. Bottom third of the order, Brignac along with Bartlett and then Deonor Navarro. The Rays pitcher is in the leadoff spot. That ball's well hit. Right center field. Long run. Cody Ross looking. Reaching. Making the catch at the track. Boy, when Cody Ross takes off after a ball, you just watch him put his head down and then go to the spot where he knows it's going to come down and arrive to him. This ball is struck hard by Brignac. He thinks he may have extra bases. But Cody with a good jump, head was down, gets right to that area, and puts it away. Fox Exmo tells all. Jason Bartlett against Brian Sanchez. So both managers have used their closers. Soriano for the Rays has gone two innings. Nunez went one inning. James Shields, one of the Rays starters, has been up and throwing the last two innings. And Sanchez pours across the strike. It's one and one. The Marlins have uh, Tankersley available, Scott Strickland, and Jorge Sosa. And we say that if, in fact, they are all available. We try to check before the game with Freddie as much as we can, but every once in a while there's a decision right before game time that, you know what, I really want to stay away from this guy. This has been used a little too much. Liner to left center. Coglin trying to cut it off in the gap. He gets there. Bartlett round first. Coglin wheels and throws. He is out. Oh, he play. Play. oh Chris Coglin. Let's get some excitement in this one. Throws out Jason Bartlett. His sixth outfield assist of the season. My goodness. On the run, a spin move, and a one-hop perfect throw to Dan Ugla. Wow. Oh, a that's face a bad plan slide. And a bad slide. Good slide, and he's safe. Wow, you could see his face and his hand got caught in the dirt. And here is Navarro. A Change good straight on inside. slide with his feet and he's safe. Yeah. A great throw by Chris Coughlin. Look at that. Left fielders, number one in assists. Navarro fouls it back. One and one. Change up ground ball foul. You know, at first, when the ball left the bat, your thought was, can Coglin get there to cut it off? You know what I thought he might do? Flip it to Cody Ross. Because he was coming in a little different angle. He said, no, nah, I can turn and make a perfect throw to second. One two from Sanchez. Coglin will do the honors. And squeeze it. Bottom of the tenth coming up. 5-5 five, five game. Man, twists and turns. The plot line is thick tonight. Chris Coughlin with a terrific play.
Five, five, five of ten. dugout on the phone talking to I'm assuming the press box to straighten out who's hitting where and sort out that bottom of the ninth inning if you just joined us the Marlins and the Rays have been in a tight struggle the Marlins came from behind and got three runs in the eighth tied at 5-5 they got a leadoff walk with Brian Barton but immediately after Barton reached first, Joe Madden popped out of the dugout. Lance Barksdale's lineup card did not match that of the Marlins lineup card. And lost in translation where the Marlins moves to set up that inning. And so Barton was called out. Freddie Gonzalez was tossed out. And here we are in the bottom of the tenth. James Shields comes out of the Rays pen. And these guys, I mean, you got you got two NBA coaches here. You know, it's it's as easy as hey, go go report to the scores table. You're in. <laughs> You're in. You got Stan Van Gundy and Eric Spolstra, and they're not leaving. Both good friends. Hey, look who's up again. It's the first relief appearance ever for James Shields in his 133rd game. The Marlins really touched him up the other day in Tampa. Three and a third innings. Marlins got nine hits and ten runs off Shields. Let's see if Barton can draw another walk. There's a chopper back behind second. Brignac's throw. Got him. Good play by Reed Brignac. Marlins had Anibal Sanchez on deck, and he probably would have come to the plate had Barton reached to try to bunt him up. So it's Hayes now, and now we've learned where the uh, pitcher spot is. And and Brett Hayes is the last available player for the Marlins, with the exception of a couple of guys in the bullpen. Two scoreless innings by Soriano. Though not uneventful innings. <laughs> this is the fourth spot in the Marlins order. Hayes hits a sharp ground ball that Longoria smothers and throws him out. Interesting, the, the Rays electing not to guard the line. If Longoria is on the line protecting for, from an extra base hit, that ball gets into left field. As Carlos Tosca looks at his lineup card, it does not now include Hanley Ramirez. Remember, he left with a, a sore hamstring. It does not include Jorge Cantu. Remember, Bonifacio pinch ran for him and stole third, but didn't score. Mike Lamb is gone. Now Hayes has been used. Well, in all this activity, the Marlins have just five hits. And we're back at that struggle now. Dan Ugla, Cody Ross, Mike Stanton, 0 for 10. And at this part of the order, Ronnie Paulino without a base hit. There is the aforementioned Jorge Sosa. Dan Ugla fouls a pitch back. It's one and one. Ugla. 
He's had a long night. He struck out three times. So the very first relief appearance for James Shields. And the guys who did the damage against Shields in Tampa, Chris Coughlin, Gabby Sanchez, Mike Stanton tripled off Shields. This is to Ugla. If Ugla reaches, then Cody comes up, and then Stanton is behind him. Poor Wes Helms. He's down in the nine spot. He's a ways away. Ugla walks. Up comes Cody. Shields does not look comfortable in his first relief appearance ever. Hayes hit a sharp ball in Longoria. You see Cody's numbers career against Shields. Boy, the outfielder's deep. They're trying to cut off a ball. Left fielder Carl Crawford is on the warning track. That's almost too deep. Literally on the warning track. B.J. Upton a few steps from the track in center field. Uh, there was the big rip. And Cody with the count now one and two. Now if you check the outfield, you can barely see Carl Crawford out there. He's on the track. B.J. Upton way out there in center field. At what point are you too deep as an outfield? I, I think that's too deep. I don't think you have to be that deep. I mean, you're talking about two guys who have great speed, too, in Crawford and Upton. One and one is the count. Good slider. One and two. We got this one tonight in a great pitching matchup tomorrow afternoon. Cody 0 for 4. Ground ball third, Longoria to second, and we will go to the 11th. The Marlins bullpen will try to hold in a 5 5 game. happened at first Chris Coughlin was nailed by that pitch from Choate in came Dan Wheeler and all of a sudden the Marlins stole some ball Gabby Sanchez Hanley Ramirez the Marlins picked up a couple of runs and were just down by a run and on this ball hit by Jorge Cantu got by the shortstop Jason Bartlett Hanley went over to third 
on an error by the third baseman, the gold glover, Evan Longoria, the Marlins tied it. Really got crazy in the ninth inning. The walk to Barton. Now, Joe Madden comes out and says, wait a minute, on my lineup card, it had Barton hitting in the number three spot and Helms. Freddie goes out to say, no, that's not what I gave you on your card. I have that on my card in the dugout. Then we saw some great defense. Cody Ross, always fun to show a Cody Ross play. And then Chris Coughlin with a magnificent play, cutting off the ball, turning, spinning, throwing, and getting the out at second base. Just remarkable. It's a battle of the bullpens now. Jorge Sosa enters in the tough spot in the lineup. Sean Rodriguez is going to hit for the Rays to lead off the 11th. This is the pitcher's spot for the Rays in their lineup. You see Sosa's numbers so far. And it's the top of the order. Rodriguez, Crawford, Longoria. Ground ball, Barden. Around it, fires it, got him. At this point, the Rays in a little better shape because they have Shields out there, a starting pitcher who's used to going five, six innings. Number 13, Here's Carl Crawford. The Yankees have won, so the Rays are a half back in the American League East. Crawford has had a great night. He's been on base four or five times. Singled, was caught stealing in the ninth inning. So some misses up and in. Ball and a strike. You mentioned the. Uh, the Yankees win, the Red Sox won, so they continue to put pressure on the, the Rays and the Yankees. That one foul back. The Rays have used seven pitchers in this ball game. Sosa is the sixth to work for the Marlins. And Carl Crawford, you mentioned the night he's had the triple, 98 triples now, the, uh, the active leader in that category. Ground ball, tough hop. Sanchez, not in time. Boy, you got Crawford running, so any any blip is going to cost you. And that's going to be a base hit. Yeah, watch this hop that Gabby Sanchez gets. Right there, comes up. He has to go down. He got a glove on it. Gave it an effort after he regrouped and got the ball, but with Crawford's speed, he was going to beat that play anyway. I will see how well Jorge Sosa holds runners here. Four base hits for Carl Crawford tonight. And a stolen base and a caught stealing. Longoria one for three. Crawford away from first. Sosa chases him back in. That's about as good a move as Jorge Sosa has to first base. What will determine whether Crawford ends up in second is his move to the plate. How quickly does he get the pitch to Paulino? Remember when he stole the base in the fourth inning, he was on a pitch out.
Carlos Tosca, of course, who managed three years in Toronto at the controls. But you got to worry about Longoria as well. Yeah, if you if you think about going quickly to the plate and then leave a pitch up, then you could get yourself in trouble. Spins one up there, and Longoria, I think, saying to himself, man, that was a cookie. That was a slider, but it was right there. Hey, what? Soriano got away with a few of those, too. How about Carl Crawford with the four hits tonight? That's the fifth time this year he's had a four-hit game. Didn't miss by much. Fox tracks it is out. Crawford increases his lead. Only been caught six times, one of those tonight. Now he's gone three and one on a really good hitter. See what Crawford decides to do on this three one pitch. Lost him. And here comes Pena. Wow, the eighth walk from the bullpen. Here's the amazing thing the bullpen has walked eight. Number 43, first place time. And the pen's given up one run. Those who can't find the strike zone, Marlins don't have a, a whole lot of choices behind him in the bullpen. Look at that. Three for four with a home run. At least it's not Carlos Delgado, a guy that owns Jorge Sosa when Delgado was in the big leagues. I think there was a time at one point in his career that Delgado homered in four consecutive at bats against Sosa. Yeah, there was. That ball's hit to right field. Stanton is there, makes the catch. Runner tags on his way to third. Stanton's throw. In there is Crawford holding first Longoria. Yeah, not too many runners would even chance that, but the fact that Crawford runs so well, he was able to get himself to third base. Good footwork by Stanton. 
And a good low throw and, again. Yeah, and the, and the low throw keeps the runner at first base, too. This guy has been a tough out, well, for everybody this year in the American League. But for the Marlins, a couple hits in this series. <laughs> ben Zobrist. Our staff, who is cracking tonight under the uh, strain of all this information. Never too late for our crack staff. The career numbers for Carlos Delgado against Sosa, 14 for 28, seven homers, 14 RBIs. <laughs> oh, wow. Nice work, crack staff. Runs away and it's 2-0. Upton's on deck. Sosa has thrown 15 pitches here in the 11th. Only seven of them strikes. the corners with two outs. Sosa to Zobrist. Now it's three and one. You'd almost rather see him walk him than give him something right down the middle. Got a right hander on deck. Yeah, you, you say that, but the tough part, bases would be loaded if he walks him, and he's had trouble throwing strikes. Yep, I agree with you. But you don't want to see a cookie right here. The proverbial rock in a hard place. Oh, outside oh, corner. Perfect pitch. Great pitch. 3 1 paint on the outside corner. Here comes the pitch number five. That's there. Just caught it. See what Zobris gets three and two. Longoria will start from first. Crawford is at third. So see the plate. going to be some sore cheeks and sore lips in South Florida tomorrow morning. These horns have been going nonstop for four hours. We'll do it again. Keeps pounding him with fastballs. He's trying to stay away. And so Zobris won't have anything to pull. at bat, Zobris walks, and now Upton, who's got two hits. Well, now nine walks from the bullpen, one by Chris Volstead, so ten walks tonight. That's a season high. Nine walks by the bullpen. And really only one of them, and that because of a fielder's choice, but 
walks really only resulted in one run scoring. Yeah. The out, pins only out of ten. The pins only given up one run of their nine walks. And you're right, Volstead's walk back in the fourth. Here is Upton. Upton was the last man that Volstead faced. Scott Strickland, Taylor Tankersley, still in the Marlins bullpen. Two walks in the inning for Sosa, no place to put Upton. Strike one. Crawford had the bad hop single. Longoria walked. Zobris walked. Strike. Been that kind of night. He was clean shaven when it started. And here's the scenario that we talked about when Zobris was at the plate. If you lose him, you got no margin for error with Upton. Boy, a must uh, strike here. The last thing. Jorge Sosa wants is to have to deal with a 3 1 pitch. So, 2 1 pitch, very important here. And Upton knows that too. Upton's got to feel pretty good. He's going to get a fastball. Wanting Ronnie Paulino to go through the signs again. Let's see what he gets. Two and one. It's up. Good patience on Upton's part, knowing that he was going to get that fastball to lay off the fastball that was up. Now three and one. Now he must throw a strike or else the Rays will take the lead. Lost him and the Rays are on top. Fastballs, all of a sudden, a lot of the fastballs, the last two in particular, missed up. The last three, three, four, five, all up and out of the strike zone. It's, uh, I guess it's just fitting with all the walks, 10 walks now from the bullpen alone, that the go ahead run comes in on a walk. Here's Brignac now. He's 0 for 4. Base is still loaded. Sosa has to throw a strike or start throwing strikes to keep it at 1, and he misses way outside. It's 1 and 0. Oh. Boy, this is the third time tonight alone 
third time that the bullpen has walked three in an inning. A couple of good innings the other night by Jorge Sosa. And you wonder if after those two innings and certainly being extended here, he's starting to run out of gas. There's a fastball for a strike. So in five and a third innings, the bullpen, actually five even innings now, doesn't have that third out here in the 11th. Five innings, 10 walks by the pen. Yes. So if you win a game like that, it's a miracle. And certainly the Marlins are going to have an opportunity if it stays one run, but Sosa's going to have to make some pitches here to keep it a one run game. Two and one. There have been over 370 pitches thrown in this game. Longoria, Zobrist, great speed with Upton at first. Yikes. Scott Strickland is up. Sosa consistently missing high. That's a strike. Now it's full. Now everybody's going to be on the move, too. And that was borderline, too. Three walks in the inning and an infield hit, a run across. Both managers now, you have to think tomorrow, you're really going to need both starters to go deep in the game. You have guys who can do it Josh Johnson and David Price. Runners on the move, 3 2 for Sosa. Fights it off. Jorge Sosa, in relief in the 11th inning, has thrown 32 pitches. 15 for strikes. This will be the seventh pitch of this at bat to bring you. Asking home plate up our Lance Barksdale, where was that? Another three two coming. Lost him. So the Rays work a couple of bases loaded walks, and I don't think the Marlins can go any further with Sosa. Carlos Tosco out of the dugout. You can boo all you want, but there isn't anybody down there that's thrown strikes tonight. Bottom line. Here comes Strickland. Getting tired of saying it. Uh, Maroney called to the pen. Maroney's not.
beef jerky all season long. Jack Links, beef jerky, feed your wild side. That sums up the Marlins bullpen. 11 walks by the Marlins pen in five innings of work. Jason Bartlett, Scott Strickland is in. Breaking ball a strike. Second appearance for Strickland since coming up from Triple A. He's got no room for error with the bag still loaded. Two runs across, and all the Rays have is an infield single. Four walks. And it's two and one. That's been a, a crazy game, and, and the Marlins, through 10 innings, have just five hits tonight. Ground ball up the middle. Barton dives. Got a piece of it, but it's going to trickle into center. And the Rays have cracked it open. Two more come across. Bartlett drives in a pair. Uh, he broke a long over his last time up with a base hit. And Bartlett just squeaks one through. Slider just out of the reach and just a piece of it Brian Barton got but couldn't grab on to it, couldn't keep it in the infield. And Bartlett gets a couple of RBIs. Here is Navarro. He takes down low. Navarro came in at a double switch, and this is his second at bat. And so far, all four runs in this inning charged to Jorge Sosa. Nine five, four runs here for the Rays. Marlins have Mike Stanton, Ronnie Polino, and Wes Helms scheduled to hit if they can get to the bottom of the 11th. You sure? <laughs> it is Wes by, Helms. By process of elimination, <laughs> Helms is in the nine spot. Lance Cormier back up in the bullpen. James Shields came in and pitched an inning in relief. Ground ball, Gabby steps on the bag and an endless inning comes to a close. The Rays four across four runs in the 11th.
Carl Crawford has been it, man. And he's been tough to get. Four hits. He scored three runs. Stolen base has driven in a run. Carl Crawford, the all-star left fielder of the Tampa Bay Rays. All right, let's regroup here and just to let you know what's which end is up. The Rays have a 9-5 lead. Shield stands to win if Lance Cormier can get these three outs. It's not a save situation. The Marlins have Mike Stanton up. There's Cormier's numbers. Stanton, Paulino, Helms. If the Marlins can get something going, then you've got Coughlin, Gabby, and Barden. The pitcher spot is due up seventh in this inning, and the Marlins have no position players left, so you would think that would be a Josh Johnson at bat. And it's a it's a night, it's a game where a lot of times you'd send your, your starting pitcher tomorrow home early, but not the case. Stand a chopper to short. It's dropped by Brignac, who has just moved over to short. <laughs> Stranger things have happened tonight. Stand is aboard. Well, the Rays have made three errors. They have not played very good defense. Make that four errors. Yeah, that's the third error by a shortstop. Here's Paulino. You know what? You're right about the three errors. They may have taken away one. No, now they've posted it. Yeah, they're just slow on the trigger tonight. <laughs> a couple of them were borderline calls on Bartlett. And Cormier goes one and one to Paulino. Another decision. A lot of things that Freddie's going to have to think about for tomorrow's game. I'm sure he he had planned to have Ronnie Paulino catch, but after after all of this, especially with the left-hander David Price going for Tampa, Paulino cranks one left field deep. Man, that's out of here, but foul. And he still may, given the fact the club does have an off day on Monday as they uh, travel to Baltimore. One and two. Helms is up next. Marlins obviously need some base runners. Polino, a, a long night behind the plate. He's just over two. Marlins don't have a lot of hits in this one, just five of them. I'm just thinking, Ronnie, a long night behind the plate. He hasn't caught a whole lot of strikes. Last time the Rays made four errors in the game was June of 09. It's been a while. Two two. Nice job by Polino, and it's three and two. They just need to move the line along. That's all you do. You want to go up there. You don't want to make it out. You want to just keep going. Wes Helms. He's next. See what Ronnie gets on a three-two pitch. He hammers it to left. That, that ball was scalding. He said, 3 2. You haven't thrown too many good sliders. You just missed badly with one. You're going to come at me with the fastball. He got it and he hammered it. Joe Madden is on his way out to talk to Cormier. There's someone in the raised pen that is starting to stretch. Now, let's see. Balfour's been in. Is that Wade Davis? Is that Wade Davis? 
Benoit's been in, Choke's been in, Cormier's in now. We saw Sonnenstein last night, but he pitched four and two thirds in. Soriano's been in, Wheeler's been in. Shields has been in for the first time ever as a reliever. Here's Wes. That's the one thing with, with Joe Madden making this move and not letting Shields go back out there. He didn't have a whole lot of safety net. Cormier oh. strike. <laughs> Next is Coglin, then Gabby, then Barden, then the pitcher spot. Helms. Pitch down low. Helms in the middle of the controversy in the bottom of the ninth. The Marlins making that actually the, the substitution that two guys came in defensively. When Nunez came in to pitch and what was on the Marlins lineup card differed from Lance Parksdale's lineup card, the home plate umpire. And Elves dumps one down the right field line. And also foul. differed uh, what was on the card in the Rays dugout, the card that Joe Madden had. That's why he came out after the bat of Barton, came out and questioned the lineup card that Barksdale had. And of course, again, the chain of command goes, you bring your change out to the home plate umpire, and then he gives the change to the opponent's dugout. So Madden only got what Barksdale told him. And obviously what Freddie communicated to Barksdale somehow got lost in translation. As you pointed out, it's an argument you can't win as a manager. No, you can't. We saw it on the Marlins lineup card in the dugout. Helms had been there, but was not announced as the uh, pinch hitter. So had not been officially put in the game. And it was at that point, Freddie saw the situation of the game. He wanted Barton to lead off the inning. And he wanted Helms to bat in the number three spot. In handling Ramirez's position, Ramirez left the game with a sore right hand. And, and that would be the logical choice if you're Freddie Gonzalez. Get a little more speed in Barton, maybe work a walk, which he did, and, and then save Helms for maybe a situation with some men on base. Absolutely. You wouldn't want Helms leading off the inning. No, you're right. And once Barton walked, Madden came out, pointed out the discrepancy. Freddie was tossed. Helms is having a terrific at bat here. He's run the count to three and two after falling behind 0 and two. Freddie was tossed. The Marlins bullpen, a walk on the wild side tonight, gave up four runs in the top of the 11 after nearly buckling in the ninth and the 10th. And it's Cormier who's left, and there's Sonnenstein. Wow. Who pitched extensively. Yesterday, let's see if Helms gets that same fastball Paulino got. Nope. Well, guess what, folks? The time run is coming to the plate, and it's Coughlin. You have to think that Wade Davis is not available if he's not up and throwing, and they've got Sonnenstein up again. Talked about Sonnenstein last night coming in to relieve Garza. Remember Garza 71 pitches in an inning and a third. Sonnenstein threw four and two thirds in. Coglin is homered. So we went after the first pitch and it was down low. It's 0 and 1. This was back in the fourth against Jeff Neiman. This was a pitcher's duel to begin with. Neiman and Volstead. 
back when the night was young. You got to swing at strikes here. Yeah, you hated to see Chris chase that first one because you got a guy out there really struggling throwing strikes. And you see how badly he missed with that next breaking ball. So the only reason it's a 1 1 count is that Cox chased that first pitch. The way this is going, we may be headed for a Josh Johnson pinch hit appearance. 1 1. Coughlin a high chopper, it's a foul ball. Mike Stanton reached on an error. Ronnie Polino singles. Wes Helms walked. Marlins are down four in the 11th. Nick the Rays bullpen has walked six. Coughlin lines it in the right center field. That's a base hit. He'll score one. Now it'll score two. Paulino comes across. And the Marlins are within two. There's nobody out. Helms is at second. Coughlin is at first. Here comes Gabby Sanchez. Now, <laughs> this is a crazy game. There's the breaking ball again. Chris Conklin goes right down after it. He has 19 multi-hit games already this year after his horrible start. Three RBIs on the night. Nobody out. And here's Gabby now, who has two hits. Formier struggling. Gabby lines it down the right field line. That's a base hit. Into the corner it goes. One run will score. Coughlin to third. He'll hold. The Marlins are within a run. There's nobody out. I have to borrow a Jack Buck line. Go crazy. <laughs> Go crazy. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Keep throwing that slider. Gabby Sanchez, his third hit of the night. Beautifully placed down that right field line. Wes Helms scores. Coughlin races over to third. Still nobody out. Sonnenstein is trying to heat up as fast as he can. Here comes Matt. Nine, eight. And Joe Bad is going to go get Andy Sonnenstein who threw 55 pitches yesterday. He's coming in the ball game. The tying runs 90 feet away with nobody out. <laughs> this is fun. Back in Bring on the horns. <laughs>
11th inning. The Rays lead it by a run. The Marlins have runners at the corners. Andy Sonnenstein, who pitched in long relief, and I mean long relief, 55 pitches worth yesterday, comes out of the Rays' bullpen. Brian Barden is up for the Marlins. There's Barden. This will be his second at bat, actually his third at bat of the ball game. But on deck is the pitcher spot. You and I were talking. You brought, brought up a great point. If, in fact, a pinch hitter is used, and it could be Josh Johnson for Scott Strickland, the only pitcher left in the bullpen is Taylor Tankersley. And if the game stays tied, Tank really can only give you one inning. So you have to think about that as well. Let's see what the Rays do defensively. Barden climbs in. Sonnenstein against Barden. Coughlin at third. Gabby's at first. Infield's in. Strike one. That was last night. How much does he have left? Well, I think we're going to find out right here. Well, this is a huge out for him to get because if he can get this out, he's going to face a pitcher. Not sure which one. Pitch out. I think Joe Mann is thinking that. I mean, he knows the position that the Marlins are in with Strickland on deck and the bullpen short. I think regardless, you have to pinch it for Strickland if you have J.J. available. That's if he's here, if he hasn't been sent home because he starts tomorrow afternoon. And that happens a lot. Harden swings and misses at a breaking ball, and it's one and two. Last at bat for Scott Strickland was 2003. Not a lot of at-bats for Barton this season. One, two. Struck him out. And it's Anibal Sanchez who comes out of the dugout. And that, that tells us that earlier tonight, J.J. was sent home to prepare for the game tomorrow. Got him with a good slider. And again, if you're if you're the Marlins, do you think about a squeeze? But if you squeeze, then you're you're playing to tie the game. And if you tie the game, you know you only have tank in the bullpen. And if you're the Rays, you're thinking if Sonnenstein doesn't strike Sanchez out, he could get a ground ball from him, and that could end the game on a double play. Sanchez actually had some pretty good at bats this year. On the air, he has five hits. He's five for 20. But he's never been up there in this kind of a role. Priority one is swing at strikes. Yeah, this is a role that he's not used to because he's going to be pitched to like a hitter in this case, not like a pitcher. Well, the Rays infield, Longoria is in looking for a bunt. The middle infield is back for two. Coglin's at third, Gabby's at first. Sanchez squares the bunt. They're trying to sacrifice the winning run over and set the stage for Dan Ugly. Now this is the this is the crash infield that the Rays employed last night, and it got them a double play. So the Marlins have to be careful here. If Sanchez does bunt, he has to run as hard as he can to first. Yeah, that was with Nate Robertson up last night. Runner goes, and he'll steal it. That's just a heads-up play, and that's a play you do on your own. You're told, hey, look, if the first baseman's going to charge in that much, he's going to give you an opening. 
And look at the first baseman, Pena. Great job. Great re reaction and great instincts by Gabby Sanchez. You don't have to be a fast runner to be a good runner. Now, do you think about a squeeze to tie it? Or just let Sanchez swing away? We'll see. You can see Navarro staring into the dugout. Not a good swing. And it's one and two. And all of a sudden, Sonnerstein has come in and thrown some really good breaking balls. Two one to get Brian Park and a couple of good ones to Sanchez. Dan Ogla is on deck. He's walked twice and struck out three times. Ray's outfield is very shallow. The infield is in. Sonnenstein struck out Borden. In the turret. What a nice play by Barrow. It's two and two. Good play by Deonor Navarro. Two and two to Sanchez. Anibal Sanchez. Sonestine bounces it up there, and now it's three and two. And that time Navarro just backhanded it. He took a chance there and picked it. You absolutely have to make sure this is a strike. If you're Anibal Sanchez, then you're going to swing. But remember, he's a pitcher who hasn't had an at-bat like this in his life. 3-2 coming. He fouls it off. Got a fastball. He's going to have a decent swing at a fastball. Now, you think he's going to get a fastball. I mean, you, you would expect a, nothing but a yeah, fastball. Especially because Sonnenstein has bounced a couple of sliders. Tying run. Out at second. The winning run. Infield's in. Got him. Sanchez strikes out. So the Marlins are down to their last out, and it's Ugla. Oh, and he got that fastball, but he located it pretty well. And tied up, Manuel Sanchez. Dan Ugla looking for his first base hit tonight. And look at his career numbers against Sonnenstein. They're not good. But then again, you're looking at Sonnenstein, who threw 55 pitches last night. And has thrown 11 already. Seven for strikes. And then again, you're looking at a game that all kinds of crazy things have happened. Sonnenstein ready the pitch. Strike. Box track says, generally when we think it's low, it catches that front corner. It was a strike. And it did. It was a great pitch by Sonnenstein. Oh one. Up the drive right field. Zobrist is there. And one of the most wacky, strange games in Marlins history comes to a close. Andy Sonnenstein comes in and saves it. The Marlins used just about everybody that was wearing a uniform. And the Rays win it by a score of 9-8. to eight. Ugla put a good swing on it and hit it hard. But Zobrist made the catch. Nine runs, 13 hits, four errors for the Rays. Eight runs, eight hits for the Fish. It's a final. The Rays outlast the Marlins. Marlins live, sort of.
coming up.